November. Here. Miss Doyle. Mr. Gatewood. Present. Miss Johnson. Mr. Ploger. Present. Miss Simelton. Present. Miss Swanson. Present. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, item 4.1 is school board member day. Each year, November 15th, marks the official statewide observance of school, bo school board members day in Illinois. Nearly 6,000 people serve on local public <laughs> school boards in Illinois across 852 school districts that serve approximately 2 million students. On behalf of our administration, staff, and community, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for your commitment that you've made in governing our school district. Most people have no idea the number of hours and evening events each of you put in on a weekly basis. You spend countless hours working on committees, attending board meetings, and pouring over thousands of pages of reports and updates you receive on an annual basis, and you do it as a service to our community to ensure that our students in our school district are getting the best, giving the best educational experience that we can provide. So tonight we say thank you for putting others before self. Your work and service are more, are more appreciated than you may know. So, Board of Education members, thank you. Yeah. 5.1, public comment. On behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to thank the public for attending tonight's meeting. We value the feedback we receive from our residents and encourage everyone to take an active interest in their public school system. Residents interested in speaking to the Board of Education this evening are asked to complete, have completed a comment card and presented it to the secretary to the board. When the secretary calls your name, I ask that you come to the microphone, state your name for the public record, and provide your feedback. Please note that comments are limited to five minutes per person and that no discussion of personnel matters or responses to questions are permitted. The board does not participate in discussions during public comment. Follow-up to your questions or concerns will be addressed by administration through the contact information provided on the comment card. Thank you. Jessica Quintero. Hello everyone. Hi. Hello. My name is Jessica Quintero and I am here to speak. Um, I have two children in the school district uh, in uh, elementary and I'm here to speak about the bus issues that we're having. So we just had our parent teacher conferences and um, we finished the first trimester and uh, the first trimester my kids have either been late to be picked up or dropped off 19 times. So as a working parent, um, both my husband and I work. Um, right now I just left Good Say, I'm rushing to get to this meeting. And I do that more often than I want to. I did that last Friday and Wednesday. Um, otherwise, I don't know what happens to my kids if I cannot pick them up by the time the school closes. I think they told me that they would have to call the police and then they would have to bring them to my house. But if I'm not home, I don't know where they would go. And uh, my kids are normally picked up at 8.12. We get an email or a text sometimes at 6 o'clock in the morning, sometimes at 8.15 when the bus is not there, saying that once the buses will finish the routes, the regular routes, they will then come back and do our children. Today we got an email saying that my kids normal well we school lets out at 350 that they were not going to be picked up at Boulder Hill till 4 p.m. and on a normal day they're already about 45 minutes on the bus so if they are now not being picked up till four, after 4 o'clock I got another text saying that they would get picked up at 412 and add 45 minutes to that. 
They have extracurricular activities, which they have missed. Um, religious education. I have already been written up once because I have been late three times in this trimester. Uh, my husband does work from home some of the times, but he is working from home, not always able to grab our kids. Um, I am here with another fellow mom who we are trying to work with, working to find a way to get our kids like carpooling in the, you know, to try to find a solution. Our bus is overcrowded. There's uh, 71 people, if I understand correctly, on a bus. Right now we have 68. Um, my kids are getting bullied on the bus, and not just my kids, but other kids on the bus. And the amount of time that it, they are on a bus when they do get picked up or drop off is longer than usual. I feel that it is, okay, I've been patient. The first trimester is already under a belt. We really need to do something about this. I cannot be the only parent that has this issue. And we have to figure out a way. If there is no buses, we have, we just, there has to be transportation. And as parents being asked to just wait till the bus gets there is no longer an option for us. Or the other parents that I have been speaking with, my other option is to quit my job, which I really love. So I am asking the board to do something about it, to help us out parents that work, and to come up with a plan for the next trimester. The sooner the better, please, I ask you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, state report card data and improvement efforts. Item 6.1 is an informational item on the school report card and what we're doing to improve academics here in SD 308. Uh, Mrs. Dahlquist, our associate superintendent for educational services, is here to present to the board. Mrs. Dahlquist, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Sparland. All right, first starting off with some good news that I think the board is already aware of. Uh, when the summative designations came out, uh, all of our schools are either at commendable or exemplary. Uh, if you recall in the past, we've had 10 schools uh, that were for targeted assistance. So we brought that list from 10 down to zero. Um, so we'll start off with a little bit of a celebration there and then get into some of the nitty gritty. I am not going through everything on the Illinois report card uh, this evening. I've chosen some highlights um, from this. We're going to look at the percentage of our students that are proficient uh, in both ELA and in math. We will look at some of the growth data and then we will spend a little bit of time on science assessment and a few other things. Uh, I think it's important as we go through to kind of compare ourselves to other neighboring districts. Uh, it is important to note that every district in the state of Illinois is available with their data on the Illinois report card, so I've chosen just a few. Um, so I've, uh, throughout the presentation, there's Naperville 204, Plainfield, West Aurora, Yorkville, uh, ourselves, and then the state for comparison. Uh, the next slide is just some more additional information from uh, things about money, salaries, teacher ratios, those types of things that may play into some of the questions that you may have. Then this next slide is really looking at what are the differences and how are we doing compared to where we were pre-COVID. Uh, and as you can see, we've decreased a lot. We had 43% of our students um, proficient in ELA prior to COVID. Now that's down at 32. And that is a statewide trend. I've shown the state average there as well. This next piece is just looking by grade level of what it looks like. Uh, and you can see it's not always the same as we go through. Uh, for reading IAR, fourth grade is the highest. Then this next piece, I chose some of the demographic groups um, to look at. And I wanted you to know that there are a lot more available than what I put on the charts. I chose for uh, the racial demographics, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. Uh, the other uh, categories are available on the report card site as well. Then I'm not gonna go through each of these slides on all of the data that is behind there. What I have done uh, is 
highlighted some of those in some narrative slides, but I did want to provide the background information if people were wanting to look at the nitty gritty on all of these things. So this is just looking at our um, percentage of students that per were proficient on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness for ELA with all our low income, our non-low income. I spend quite a bit of time looking at the difference between boy and girl achievement, looking at how we are doing with different learning styles. Uh, that is something that we've been worried about in this district for uh, a while, in a few years, so we continue to look at that. And then, of course, looking at the different uh, racial demographic groups as well. This next piece is a little hard to uh, explain, but it is all of the growth pieces of data. So the state looks at those students that had scores this year, uh, which was last spring, uh, and then what their growth was the time before that and compares students from similar uh, scaled scores to those. Interesting and really important that everybody knows, if you're a third grader from last year, you can't have growth data because that was your first year of taking IAR. It's also really important to note that if you weren't here during COVID and you were in remote instruction, you also don't have a score from some of those years. So we anticipate uh, as we go and look at growth data in years forward that we will have a significant change in the number of students that go into this piece. So some of the key findings, um, SD 308, like many districts around the state, is not at pre-COVID levels yet. Uh, I know people are saying, how long will it take? <coughs> I'm not sure yet. Um, we're gonna have to keep track of that. We are slightly above the state average um, for the all category. We do have opportunity gaps with boys scoring lower than girls and black and Hispanic students scoring lower than white students and Asian students. Our growth rates are lower than the state in every demographic group other than black students. And then there is similar growth for each demographic. So as you look at these, there are celebrations, but there are also great opportunities for improvement that we need to continue to address. This next piece is the high school piece of the SAT reading data. And again, there are all the scores. But it's important to note that we score better than all the comparison districts that I chose, except for uh, Indian Prairie in the demographic groups of all low income girls and white students. Our boy girl opportunity gap is larger than the comparison districts. So what we've seen with our own data through FastBridge and other pieces, is that we are right to continue to address that in the instructional styles that would be needed to lower uh, that opportunity gap. And then we do score better than the state in all demographic groups other than Asian. This next piece is just a slide on uh, how our English learners are doing and also our children with disabilities, which the state now calls uh, CWD, uh, and those students that have IEPs. What I really want to get into is what are the things that we're going to do to improve. And it's important to note that we do not wait until the state comes back with the test scores. Uh, this work starts way in the spring and continues into the fall. We have a district improvement team uh, composed of district administrators, principals, and assistant principals from the different levels. Uh, and we get together and look at not only state data, but our own FastBridge assessment data, uh, and also looking at our classroom walkthroughs on what we see are good instructional practices and not. And then we build a plan. And each of our schools has a school improvement plan that is aligned to this as well. So these are some of the things that we're doing for reading. Uh, as you know, we do have a K-8 literacy framework. Uh, the school improvement district-wide team now has six different design teams. One is on reading at K-8. Uh, we also have a high school academic design team that is working on that. And our framework now has gone from K-8 to being that to include high school with some different components of that. Uh, as you know, we've started a high school reading intervention program for our freshman students uh, this year, which we've uh, put in place staff uh, and uh, data to collect on how we're doing in that area. You already know that we do lots of classroom walkthroughs, but each year we highlight different pieces that we have provided professional development on with the staff that we are then walking uh, to see how well we are inspecting uh, what we expect uh, with those pieces. And then we have our own data that we use at fall, winter, and spring to look at how are we decreasing the opportunity gap uh, and how are we in doing increasing our reading achievement. 
Uh, and then one of the big pieces of work uh, that we're just really getting into is looking at our different reading interventions to have some integrity checklists of how those are being implemented at each school uh, and then how we keep data to know how effective those different reading interventions are. Uh, this is our K-8 literacy framework and the areas that we're really working on are circled uh, where we have independent reading time where students have choice. Uh, that is one of the purposeful things we are doing to raise boy achievement uh, so that there is some choice in what that looks like. And also part of that is that diversity statement there at the bottom. We spent quite a bit of money to bring more diversity into text selections that are available for students so that when they do have independent reading, they have things from their own interests or from authors uh, that re really they can see themselves in. Another big push is the small group instruction where we differentiate that and that arrow is pointing to those two statements at the bottom. That was reading. All right, math, um, very similar data that I've uh, prepared for us. Again, looking at that pre-COVID, we were at 39%, we're now at 31%. The state and every other district is seeing that um, piece where there's not as high a student achievement yet. Uh, this is the math uh, IAR by grade level. Uh, and what I'm encouraged by this is you see our third grade is highest and then we see lowers. If we can keep that third grade level and move them to the next grade level, we are gonna continue to see improvement there. The next piece is the percentage of students proficient on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness by all those different demographic groups that I already explained in reading. This is the math growth. And then here are some highlights. Again, SD 308, like districts around the state, we're not where we were pre-COVID yet. We are above the state average in all demographic groups except for Asian. We do have opportunity gaps with girls scoring lower, lower than boys and black and Hispanic students scoring lower than white students. As I said, grade three is the highest. And then our growth rates are higher than the state in every demographic group except for Asian. So our math scores overall, um, we, we shine a little brighter in math than we do in reading at the moment. This is the high school, the math SAT data. Similar types of things, our low income and Asian groups have a lower percentage proficiency than the state, but all other demographic groups are higher than the state. When you compare us to um, most of the districts with the exception of 204 and the demographic groups of all non-low income, boys, girls, and white students, we score better. Uh, and then this is the slide on our English learners, our children with disabilities, and students with an IEP. And then getting to the most important part is what are we doing to improve upon this? And one of the biggest things that we can do to raise scores, especially for our low income students. But as you know, we have low income students that are also girls, boys, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, is to work on math vocabulary instruction. And the more we spend on the vo time on precise math vocabulary instruction, the more our scores will raise. And it will really make a big difference when we get to junior high and high school math instruction scores. So that is something that we've been working on. Uh, and then you knew we had a K-8 math framework. The high school team has now adopted that. We are now K-12 uh, with those pieces and the math department chairs are working uh, with Dan Artson and I on how to um, train our high school staff around some of those good practices. We also have the high school math intervention program for our freshman students with brand new junior high resource this year. And uh, as you may or may not know, when you adopt a new resource, you do usually see a little bit of a dip as teachers are getting used to using all of that. But we certainly are hearing about high levels of engagement. Uh, so we're encouraged on how that will work uh, and help us with what we need to get done. Uh, and then each of our schools do have a solid tier one math instruction program that they're working on with certain improvement areas. Uh, we monitor those, we bring the principals together so that they can peer uh, coach each other and share about what are some of the best practices with that. Uh, and then just like I said for reading interventions, we have to do that for math. And as a district, we have a lot less math interventions 
and so especially at the elementary level we have some schools that are doing really well with that and we have other schools that need more resources in order to be able to do math interventions this is the math framework the highlight now is it's not k-8 it's k-12 as you can see and then our big push is collaborative structures with individual accountability for all and again that precise math vocabulary Skipping over to science assessment data, this is just what it looks like from the district comparison to the state. The state did not place a lot of emphasis on that this year. In fact, in the overall, it was science participation, but that will be changing, so we need to keep track of how we are doing on this. Some other measures, this is ninth grade on track uh, from the district and the state comparisons. The next piece is the graduation rate, uh, and I just chose the four-year. You can look at five-year and six-year graduation rates as well. And this is by the district and state and different demographic groups. This next piece is new uh, and yet old data. So it's a new format that is now available on the Illinois Report Card around our equity journey uh, and the state puts it into student learning, learning conditions, and elevating educators. It is important to note that all the data that the state used to compile this is from 2018, 2019. So while the report is new, the data is old. Um, and there are different pieces that go into each of those. The student learning piece not only looks at uh, state assessments at the upper grades, but it also looks at how our students are doing when they enter our school at kindergarten. Uh, and what readiness they are and what are the different opportunities uh, between all the different demographic groups. Learning conditions goes into um, suspension data, those types of things, and then elevating educators goes into what different ratings we are having by the different subgroups and demographic groups of teachers. Uh, and then just wanted to bring everybody back to that some of climate for learning can be measured by standardized tests and things that are on the Illinois report card, but certainly not all of it. And when you uh, think about some of the forums that we've just had and the skills that our students need, it's important to say yes, student test scores are really important, but there are other pieces um, and skills that we are developing for our, teacher, for our students and with our students that are not easily measured by this. So then how have we supported this uh, with all of the pieces that we need to do? Using COVID relief funds, we've hired 18 academic interventionists. We hired five instructional coaches. We've hired counselors, social workers. We've provided extended summer school uh, and summer connections for elementary, created a kindergarten step-up program. Uh, and then I already mentioned the reading materials that we've purchased. And then uh, people, especially administrators that are listening at home will laugh. I always talk about how do we inspect what we expect. We will have done 2,000 classroom walkthroughs when we're done in March. We'll just have completed 960 of them. And we go in to see how well we're doing at supporting teachers and getting where they need to be so that we can support our students. Uh, we do have the principals report out what percentage of staff are doing some of our expectations. So when the principals are doing their own walkthroughs, then we can have a check pace uh, and see if that kind of matches what we're seeing as well. And I already talked about school improvement plans um, and our student achievement data. And then we do look at student and staff uh, and community surveys for, again. This is just what the forum uh, came up with on all those different skills. And then while I started with a celebration, I also want to end with a caution. Right now we have everybody at commendable and exemplary. And these are all the statistics that went into each of those designations. And next year, it changes. Not only will the growth rates that we see up there, we will have more students be part of that. That could help. That also might hurt some of that. But we also got points this year for science participation and what percentage of students took the test. We anticipate that that's going to change to actually how well did you do on that. And then just like No Child Left Behind where the uh, percentage of students that needed to be making adequate progress ratcheted up each year, that is part of this as well. So each year you will have to get increasingly better 
to remain as a commendable and exemplary. So even if we did exactly the same as we did this year, that would not put us in place to necessarily be at commendable or exemplary next year. All right, question. I have one question. Um, thank you for that, that was awesome. I, I always love to look at this data. Um, and so you briefly spoke about the opportunity gap for low income students. Uh, but what have we identified and what are we doing in regards to the opportunity gaps? And even I, I didn't realize it until I just looked at the graduation rate for black and Hispanic students who have historically been low in the district, especially for ELA and math. So part of, and I don't know which you want me to identify first, uh, our reading and our math scores, um, when we work on providing choice, when we look at providing text from various uh, backgrounds and information to make sure that we find something for everyone, that will help with the literacy piece. Also a lot of the training that we're doing on bias and microaggressions and how staff is in doing at providing an inclusive safe learning environment with our climate for learning. While that's not a directed at reading practice, certainly in our district we're talking about climate for learning because if you don't have that overall piece to make sure that you see other staff members that look like you, that can react with you, that's a part of that. That's also how um, when we talk about being responsive instruction, it's how do you respond to all the students in your class, not the aggregate, not the majority, but how are you looking at different learning styles and different needs? And that helps all of those students. When we look at our um, low income pieces, uh, low income can, uh, if we do well with that, will impact the overall white scores, black scores, Hispanic scores, uh, it definitely low income. We have some of our demographic racial groups that have a higher percentage of low income than others uh, and that does play into those pieces. The things that really need to uh, boost up with low income, when we talk about what we've done across the district to increase the amount of independent reading time, that's one of the big differences, not always, but generally that our families from low income don't have a lot of books at home or aren't you know, setting aside as much time for that. So that's one of the research-based practices that we're doing to increase that for our low-income students. And then I already talked about the math vocabulary. With the graduation rate, all of that feeds into that, whether you're feeling, you know, do you have a trusted adult? Are there people coming alongside you? Is instruction being differentiated to be of interest to you and needs? All of that feeds into that graduation rate. Okay. Um quick follow-up one. Sure. I'm interested. I, I, I appreciate your research um, and even your focus on the boy versus girl um, mm -hmm. research that you're doing. Tell me a little bit more about what caused you to focus on that specific demographic. So one of the things when I was preparing for an interview to come to this district is I looked at um, past trends and that's something that's always interested to me in my last two districts of being assistant superintendent because I think it goes unchecked. Uh, and I believe it's one of the best ways to help us all know our impact on beating the needs and being responsive to students. There is no brain research out there that says that boys' brains are better than ma at math or girl. It's how we teach or how it has been brought about. So when I see a big gap there, and there is a larger gap in this district than back then than there should be, um, and we started way back then, and then COVID came, uh, and there wasn't as much data to look at that. But um, one of the things that happens with reading is, in general, and I'm speaking gross generalities, not every girl, not every boy, we aren't even all binary, but there are different types of styles of what learning styles you can address with that. And in reading, we tend to have a conversation and we talk about the emotions with reading and we don't have specific goals or learning targets. If we start having specific goals and learning targets, our, our boys will start doing better in literacy. We also have to have informational text. It can't all be um, fiction. Then in math, 
if we are not having time for collaborative structures and discourse and having some creativity our girls typically don't do as well so there are proven practices put into place but we've had trend data now not only with our uh, state assessment data but fast bridge and we're seeing those pieces but some of our schools don't have a difference between the gender you know there's no gender opportunity mm -hmm. gap hmm. you can have the same grade levels the second grade is oh there's a huge opportunity gap third grade doesn't have it at all mm -hmm. what's so fascinating is if I don't look at my data and I go and do classroom walkthroughs I start going I'm not seeing this you know I'm, I'm seeing what I think would be a, a an issue because it's more geared toward and then I look at the achievement data and it's that way now we have had some grade level teams that have already made progress in this so I'm hoping that we will get there uh, and have that opportunity gap shrink um, I know we'll get there it's just how much time it will take oh and you got me started Eugene I could spend hours talking about this so. I know. and isn't it don't be sorry doesn't this <laughs> no, also hold deal. true yeah. for students of color these same conversations that you're having the same conversations and I have found that you first have to get people to know that they teach to their learning style usually or how they were taught and if we can show the differences between uh, gender because every you know I have a husband I have a son I have those pieces then we know our impact and how our learning styles affect how we teach and then you have that responsive instruction to then open that up to different demographics in addition to gender but to look at race to look at low income and realize that one instructional style does not meet all of the students in your room and so this instructional style that you speak of on um, slides 18 and 21 you talk about third grade and the importance of doing well here um, are there demographics that are not doing well if when you disaggregate that data and if they and if so what are we doing about it because you know um, a lot oftentimes they say that you know the third grade is like really important and you start to see the drop-off in um, their learning like in from the third grade to the right. fourth grade and, and and do you do you see that as the same issues that you're talking about regarding gender um, and and race yes all of those pieces um, I, I sometimes argue uh, that where we really really need to look at data is foundational even before third grade yep. and looking at those pieces because if you start looking at third grade you've lost so much of the time and those fundamental key skills that really can be measured by some achievement tests and those things are early literacy early numeracy and by the time that you're at 10th 11th grade or later than that that's why we spend a lot of time uh, with our elementary staff looking at sight words letter sounds counting all of those pieces that do not aren't measured from the state because we don't start that assessment till third grade but it really has to have all of that all of those pieces and looking at responsive instruction the more we can get to that by second semester of kindergarten and on is really where it needs to focus so we understand that and we're doing that yeah. yes right. i it's not an overnight process but yes can I, can I jump in on that one sure so I was glad to hear you say historical data but I'd rather see that than the other district scores do you know what I mean okay. like I'd, I would rather see our scores over the years instead of what's some other district doing okay but as you know trend data is hard the last few years right right, right. but we have data from but we have historical data on a sure. lot of these kids and then um, I was looking at your in reading interventions mm -hmm. and then third and fourth grade is really where they start taking all those sight words and putting them all together and that's where you find all these reading problems but I also again I didn't see any Erland screenings on there I noticed that you guys had freshman high school interventions mm -hmm. for reading and again I it's a missed opportunity if we have people trained for Erland screenings and we're not using it it's a huge missed opportunity and I don't think it belongs just in the grade school I think it belongs all across all of these levels with the notable exception of if we're pulling kids out for high school reading interventions they should be being tested in there too because they can't read it if they can't see so, it I know and I know and I keep, you you keep bringing this up I and do so over maybe, and over so, and so over. maybe we need to like 
we just need to have a conversation about it at some point. Like, right? Let's just because we we don't really know what you know. And so I think in order for us to understand what you're so passionate about, we maybe need to just bring it here so that we can understand it. Because, you know, I mean, I've, I've read things about it, but, um, you know, if, you're, if you think it's, you know, you're that passionate about it as the board, we maybe need to understand it too. Because it's not a directive that the board is giving to say we should be using Erlen, right? And right, but we did train a bunch of kids with some uh, we, kids. Yeah, we no, trained I, a bunch of teachers with ESSER funds to be able to do this, and we had a presentation at one point. So we could call Pam Krasinski, who's the leading Erlen screener in the well, state, I and hear have her from, come in. Well, I really want to hear from like our reading specialists through you know through Faith. I want to hear like what are we doing with it? Why are we doing? We're it? not doing what anything with it right now. Well, whatever we we're doing, maybe we should all know about it. I don't disagree. So if I can jump in here, we did have a presentation about it at one point that, that was going to be ongoing as part of, I believe, Denise's presentation a few months ago. But one of the things also, Allie, to your point about the historical data in our thing, I had thought about that also, but one of the things that I also remembered was that we've had a few different tests a standardized tests to go on. So we don't really have historical data from this test. We we had, what was the one before this? I, no, it was something else. What, in any event, the name doesn't isn't matter, doesn't matter. What it means is that we haven't actually had a fair shake to look at our own historical data with a consistent testing program. And to be perfectly frank, some of these testing things don't actually speak to students' real ability. So I kind of take some of this with a grain of salt, although it's important. And we gotta know, and you gotta measure something somehow. Um, but I would, I would like us just to keep in mind as we're looking at our historical data that we, we can't necessarily, that's just not, maybe not an option. Yeah. Because it's all different tests. Well, and the student, what was proficiency as I saw, you know, as I showed the st right. whole state average has gone down. So to look at trend data, you are, we, we did take a hit during yeah. COVID yeah. Um, statewide. So what, I used to love looking at trend data and looking at all of those pieces too. But when you realize that instruction was diminished, looking at that trend data isn't as valuable as it is during a regular time with the same test. Didn't you also say that there was a huge drop in the number of students participating? So uh, if you did, Correct. right, so I don't, I don't really know what we're going to really be able to compare to if we're not really comparing apples to apples at that point. Correct. But are we, well, well I'm well, sorry, we just go ahead. wasted an hour on it. No, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd consider it a waste so much. I mean, this is important information to know. I'm particularly interested in looking at our graduation rates particularly interested in looking at some of the data for our demographic groups. And, and there is something to be said for comparing against where the state average is compared to where our funding is for, for some of these other areas too. So uh, please don't think that what I'm saying is that this isn't valuable, it is. But it's not the only thing, as I think Faith had mentioned. I was just gonna ask, um, do we see any, uh, any information pulled from FastBridge? Um, sure. Like any relevant or more relevant uh, trends you know, within um, the district and we growth? We still have the opportunity gap um, between a gender, but also between our racial demographic groups, uh, low income to not. We see those similar pieces, um, but we also then have early at the beginning of second grade that we can track and look at that. And we are seeing that this year's scores are coming in much higher than last year's scores, which would be, we would predict because some students hadn't been in person instruction for quite some time but we saw a lot of gain and we saw even gain from spring of last year to fall of this year where some of that recouped even during the summer which we wouldn't see in a regular time so uh, we are optimistic as we look at fast bridge that's measured three times a year and not as lagging that we're starting to see bigger jumps than what we usually and we need to because it was lower last year than it had been pre-COVID, 
but we're seeing those types of pieces and we are seeing some schools that have really focused in on uh, the gender opportunity gap that have made a lot of progress. Great, yeah, I mean, yeah, especially yep, we if, could, if we I can, could, I could take I learnings. Could bring fast bridge down. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, show proof in the pudding, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that, yeah. One other statement is uh, you, you mentioned uh, when thinking about the criteria of this data, mm -hmm. actually now I got two thoughts. So thinking about the criteria of this data, you said that there was this, as Dominic was saying, there's a subset of students that are not included. So do we know the demographic of, that, of the students that were not? And then are we doing something now to get ahead of the assessment when they are included because otherwise, <laughs> it could so, significantly impact. Right, and I think you're referring to the students. You know, so everyone was here for the assessments for last year, but the year before that, yeah. uh, some of our schools were as low as 50, 55 percent of students in person, and only those students took the test, so that only those students would be able to have growth data Correct. to do those pieces. And certainly, I'm speaking in broad generalities, but our um, schools that have the highest percentage of low income had the lowest of in-person attendance. Yes. And nationwide, SD30 being the same, our low income students are the students that we struggle the most to meet their needs and to bring them along. So as they were the largest part of our students that were not here for in-person instruction, I am very concerned about what that means when they rejoin all of those growth rates. So all of the things that we would be doing to improve math instruction, such as vocabulary instruction and reading, really working on the independent reading piece, we need to do. But as I'm meeting with schools, uh, such as the school improvement team um, at one of our elementary schools that is looking at their second grade data this year, and our second grade scores, especially from schools that have a high percentage of low income, we're really worried about they were not here for phonics instruction. Yeah. They were not here for those early literacy pieces. So we are actually reallocating um, some of the interventions and the time and have made some difficult decisions such as we need to back off of social studies instruction during second grade for this chunk of students so that we can get more early literacy skills in because I can catch them up on social studies information later much easier than I can catch them up on learning to read. Yeah. So and we have reallocated as we look at students that we're really concerned about and we have a high percentage in second grade at some of our schools. So I, I, and I appreciate and understand that the tool that we're using as far as tests and even the historical um, measurement associated with it is not the primary and the only way that we can determine if a, a student is going to be successful or, or their aptitude. However, what is consistent with all of the measurements and on every slide that we're looking at is that low-income, black, Hispanic um, students have always, are, 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 are consistently um, at or below, not even at, below the you know, every other student demographic. And so I just want to make sure that we're, um, and I know you are, and you're expressing right, it, right. that we're continuing to figure out not just what are we doing, because if we don't identify why it is, then we may not be doing the right things. And so that's the reason why I want to make sure that we're identifying why and right. continuing to make efforts to help. Right. That yeah, I, I actually talked to Dr. Waller, talked to Dr. Waller today, and we're hoping you know, to, to dig in and continue the work that's been done and, and trying to get actions. Because um, it's not a small achievement gap. You know, it's, Say it one more time. Sorry. It's not a small achievement gap. It's not. Right. So, I mean, it's, if, 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 we could, if we could pull, um, if we can get everybody, you know, up and, and re get that achievement gap lowered, I mean, this district, I mean, it would just look just awesome on paper. <laughs> You know, um, and and, and the kids and in reality <laughs> is what I'm saying. You know, so yes. um, it would benefit everybody. Absolutely. And so, yeah, let's make those efforts. Um, just a couple things. Uh, just a couple things. Um, you know, you had touched about 
the difference. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, it might not show up on a test, but one of the concerns I have is some of our reviewing some of our systems and setting our students up for success instead of failure. And I'll talk about it again. Junior high, very concerned. I noticed none of our secondary are exemplary. They're all commendable. Um, and if, if I gotta be honest with you, as, as someone who was a junior high uh, boy, um, sitting in lunch for 42 minutes and not sitting with my friends and in this day and age telling me I can't have a phone uh, 42 minutes and I'm not being active uh, and as you rightfully point out I'm going to have to have a set of goals on top of that uh, and there probably aren't really a, a set of goals during lunch other than go eat probably in 42 minutes pretty sure I can get that done in less than 42 minutes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you I've 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 seen some junior high boys put away some food in a lot less time than 42 minutes, maybe 42 seconds. Um, that that's a concern, and that's just one example where I fear that some of the things that we've set some of our students up, and but that can impact their entire day, and can in, impact their entire instruction. Um, that's one piece. The other thing I noticed the teacher salary piece. I'm curious how much of that might be longevity. Do our teachers stay here uh, is one question. Another question is, does that factor in them subbing? Um, because I'm, I'm well aware of how that works in this district. And a, a third follow-up question, and you can answer all three and then I'll leave you alone, um, is does that also include them having to sub for our teacher assistants? And is that happen happening with a tremendous amount of frequency because we are short on that as well because you can correct me if I'm wrong but I believe when they're subbing for our teacher assistants they're making their what they would make not what our teacher assistants are making and I'll let you answer to all of those because I did notice that sure. stuck out to me sure um, so junior high lunchtime that is something that we're continuing to look at uh, and it is it's been looked at for a few years uh, that would probably require some um, contract negotiations and pieces of what that looks like. I know our director, uh, Dr. Um, Shannon Luters, has uh, come to me several times as well as the principals about how they would like to change that. So we'll continue to look to see how to make that happen. Um, but I think they agree. Yeah, just follow up. So sure. continuing to look at it, so they're just admiring the problem or because I'm looking. Well, looking like as, three. so we're getting ready to do OEA negotiations again. So oh, that okay. would be part of doing all of that. But without some of the changes there, uh, Got it. we have not been able to figure out how to make that happen. Okay. So a little bit of both. Um, then you asked me a lot of questions about the teacher salary piece. Um, longevity, as you know, um, as teachers move up the um, steps and those kind of things, that definitely plays into that. If we had a huge retirement and had lots of new teachers, that would bring down the average salary piece. That is salary. That isn't additional hours of subbing or teaching assistant pieces that are that play into that. Okay, so and I was going to say, Jared, obviously educational attainment by the teacher. So there's a, you know, as you know, as an educator, there's a big difference between a teacher with a bachelor's degree or a teacher with a master's plus 47. So the, you know, the uh, educational attainment plus years of experience greatly influ influence the average salary that's listed for school district 308. So it's safe to say that our staff is experienced and has high level of education. Yes, we have, uh, I think it's 70, 70 something percent of our teachers have master, master's degrees or beyond. To, to that point though, I, you know, I still am gonna ask this question because you know, the, the stress level of our staff can still kind of affect sure. you know, education delivery and I am curious and, and a little concerned how much, um, how much our teachers are having to sub in these cases, do we know to what degree this is this is happening? How much our teachers are internally subbing? Yeah, that'd be something we need to have HR HR look at to actually provide you any data on. That's also every district. I subbed twice today. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's every district. I didn't. A lot. Yeah. yeah. Were you subbing for a TA? As or you know, that's part of the. I was subbing for for another physics teacher okay. twice, but I don't think she answered the question about the TAs. Which, what was the question about? The so, so I'm, yeah, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, 
I understand the part about subbing for other teachers, and yeah, I mean, I, I, to your point, Allie, there is, you know, there's RSV and flu and 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 COVID colliding at once. So I do understand there there are illnesses that we're all having to deal with, right? I get that point, but are we in a situation where we have teachers who are subbing for TAs um, because we're short? Okay, because I mean that it's one thing if I've got to call, you know, Allie's got to come down and cover my class because you know, you know, the, our whole wing is out because we all have caught something, right? I mean, we get that that's going to happen in waves, but if it's because we can't we can't staff properly, that is a continuous strain, and and I get that last year is last year. <laughs> Nobody wants to repeat last year, but I do think some of these things have. An effect. You know, that was part of a conversation we were having at the open forum with a couple of uh, uh, parents in regards to the TA positions. And uh, what you're, you know, if I, I would love to be able to have the information in front of you, but at that meeting, I, you know, I texted a couple of my peers of the large school districts in our area to, to ask them the numbers of TA positions, what their starting salaries are. So uh, most of these school districts have the same issues that we're having in regards to TAs. It's you know, and uh, when you compare salaries, even even school districts that have higher salaries are still having the issue of filling the, the teacher assistant positions because it's, I think it's a uh, it's a it's a person it's a manpower issue, in regards to the number of people that are out there looking for these types of positions. So that leads into what like Faith mentioned. Yes, yeah, sometimes teachers do have to you know sub. Sometimes we do are looking at contracting teacher assistant positions because uh, we're doing everything we can to fill the position so we have properly trained people working with our kids. Can I, can I piggyback on that with one other question that I had? It was on slide 32. I just took my glasses off. I should not have. Um, yeah, where we talked about hiring 18 academic interventionists. We hired five instructional coaches, counselors, social workers. Um, all of that was hired with ESSER funds. Correct. And ESSER funds end this year. Next year. So, Next year. Right. Well, so that's going to have an impact on negotiations as well. I think if, you're, if our plan is to keep those positions without extra ESSER funds, those funds have to come from somewhere, which would be our budget. We've allocated uh, a certain amount of dollars to those, uh, but some of those positions would go away after next year. Correct. And then my last question last was oh, go. Um, on slide 30, where you talked about the equity data journey. Yes. Is that data going to get caught up? So I assume that as the state is collecting those those pieces of information that they will next year use more current data, correct? And that's data that the state pulls from every district. That's not, like we didn't choose to only give them 2018-19 data. No, Are there any other questions for Ms. Douglas? That was a lot of good information. Thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item 7.1. Uh, good evening, board. So I have a few things I want to share this evening. But uh, first off, I'd like to just say a, con a couple congratulations to a couple of our athletic teams because uh, District 308 did uh, set some history this, this fall. So we just finished our fall winters, our fall sports season, and now we're moving on to our winter sports season. But before we do, I'd like to congratulate the OE and OHS boys and girls cross country teams uh, this year for the first time in district history. Both of the uh, both of the boys and girls teams from both high schools qualified for the state final, and uh, I had the opportunity to go watch them run, and it was really nice to see that many 308 kids in the in the uh, finals. Um, the OE girl OE girls finished 18th. And the OHS girls finished 21st. Audra Soderlund uh, had a 19th uh, place as an individual, which makes her all state. And the OE, OEHS boys finished 15th. And Parker Nold finished 8th as an individual, with the OHS boys finishing 25th. So very good year for both of them. Also, our OE girls volleyball team had a record-setting season as they uh, set the school record for the most wins and uh, won the program's first-ever regional title. In girls swim and dive co-op, Katie Malm was the sectional champ in uh, diving and advanced the state. Uh, the team finished fourth at the sectionals with uh, the following swimmers who advanced the state, Chloe Diner, Katie Gresick, 
Caitlin Stoddard, Maddie Wiska, and Juliana Pignato. So just a uh, quick, quick piece about the uh, fall athletics because we had a lot of good success. Um, this a reminder, this Wednesday we have our second community advisory committee meeting here at Oswego East from 6 to 7.30. This is a reminder that the committee meeting is uh, open to the public to listen to and watch the conversation and dialogue, and we do have public comment at those meetings. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit about safe and inclusive schools tonight. Earlier this year, we had a presentation from uh, Mr. Bell and Mr. Frieders and what we're doing to increase safety in our schools. Uh, this is something that we're always looking at and how to ensure the safest environment for our students and staff. In conversations with them last week, I asked for an update and asked for some items we talked about earlier this year with the board, as well as uh, items I've asked them to look into since then. They shared that they've been working uh, extremely hard with the other district departments to monitor installation of our camera system and overall live stream video infrastructure for the elementary buildings. Uh, Mr. Frieders has taken an active role in our life safety walks with ROE and to upgrade our district radios, which is a big project here in 308. Uh, we're currently looking at additional safety mitigation measure measures at our initial point of entry for all of our school buildings uh, in the form of updated call boxes and protective window film. And we are in the process of up updating our intergovernmental agreements with our law enforcement partners on body-worn cameras and live stream camera access in the event of an active threat situation. Body-worn cameras legislation passed and is going into effect on January 1st of this of uh, 2023. Um, in regards to student voice, we're in the process of increasing the number of students on the superintendent uh, st student advisory committee. Uh, we're doing this to ensure we have representation from as much of our student body as we can. Um, and this committee is starting to work on what their uh, the next items that they would like to address, which is uh, mental health. And I'm sure uh, uh, Anya and Caitlin will have more to say about that in a few minutes. And I'd just like to also highlight the work of Dr. Waller and the Student Coalition, uh, who presented at the Amplify event on November 3rd at the Performing Arts Center here at school. The focus of the event was on mental health and uh, where the students were asked a series of questions, they provided answers. It was a powerful event that provided a platform uh, to amplify our student voice. And finally, uh, I've, I've said this a couple times, but I'm gonna remind everyone that this Saturday at the Triple I Conference, uh, we will be presenting in Chicago to what I'm sure will be hundreds of people on uh, amplifying student voice with a seat at the board table, and which is very exciting. So those are just a few things happening in SD 308, and that's my report for this evening, Mrs. Hamilton. Thank you, Dr. Sparlin. 7.2, board member comments. And um, I, I'd like to start out and talk a little bit about our open forum that we had on Monday, November 14th. Well, when was it? November 7th. And each of our board members will just take a, a minute or so to um, report out what was happening at their tables. But what we wanted to do was start a conversation so we want to be very intentional about our open forums going forward and what they look like and how they're structured. And so um, we're, we're very intentional about having an opportunity for board members to come into an environment where they get to select the table in which they sit and interact and engage. And those um, particular tables might reflect like student services or diversity, equity, and inclusion, or educational services. And at each of those tables, there's, there's a board member as well as uh, members of the administration to engage uh, you in conversation as opposed to just one way um, avenues by which you can communicate with the board, whether that's via um, emails or other ways in which it's just very static um, as opposed to being dynamic. And so we're very much interested in listening and, to, and having two-way conversations, having um, critical you know, dialogue. And so we, we did that on um, the first and we got some great feedback. And so each of our board members, if they have, um, wanna just share a little bit about what was happening at their particular tables. Sure, I'll go first. <clears throat> um, first, I, I just want to say I appreciated the forum. And uh, after the meeting, I actually received emails from members of the community uh, talking about how much they appreciated the, the, the new format of the forum as well. 
Um, I was at the finance table, and during our session, we had a very productive dialogue with members of the community, and they expressed their concerns and even gave recommendations about the following. Um, one was the TA shortage in the district, and even we discussed in comparison to uh, the shortages that are also happening in, in, in other surrounding districts. We also talked about ways uh, or how to attract additional TAs, and the recommendation was to increase the pay um, and even the financial breakdown of how that would impact um, SD 308. We also talked about the impact of com the comparable TA pay when teachers are actually subbing for TAs uh, and just the how that could how that could impact the morale of, of some of the, the staff. And we talked about facilities planning and the costs associated with uh, maintaining 23 buildings within our district. And then lastly, we talked about student fees and um, how high they were for some of the parents and what we, what we could do in order to mitigate some of that cost. Thank you. Anyone else want to share out from their table? I do. Yes. Um, the, first, the first thought I had was that I really enjoyed this new format. But I would have enjoyed Ms. Hamilton if you'd also had a table too, and I know you were facilitating, so that would be my feedback, is that if you wanted to be able to do that and participate, that might be beneficial. Yeah, so I actually sat at each of the tables. Your table was full, so I didn't get an opportunity to sit at your table, but I did sit at each of the other tables and Good. engage in the conversation. That's great to hear. I think it's really important that everybody participate in the forum as well. So I'm glad that you were doing that. Um, at our table, it was very full. We had a lot of administrators at our table. We had um, uh, Faith, Heather, Shannon, Tammy, and Dan, and which didn't leave a whole lot of other seats, but we did have a few really good conversations, one surrounding how are we providing extra support to our junior high students that are taking high school math, um, and what kind of strategies um, could be used in junior high for those students. And then um, the other conversation surrounded suicide awareness and, and mental health and well-being of our students. And I think um, both of those were, were great conversations. I didn't, we had some folks stay a few sessions, so we didn't get to talk to everyone, but um, yeah, it was pretty good. Thanks. And what Lori's referring to is that after 15 minutes, you can get up and move to another table if you so choose, or if you're still very engaged at the table that you're sitting then you can continue to remain there. So we had three um, rotations in which you had opportunity to sit at different tables. Um, yeah, I was at the um, English learners table. Um, the, the topic that was brought to us was um, uh, limited uh, capacity in dual language. Um, gentleman said uh, bilingualism is a critical future skill. Um, need to address the need for more space, maybe options and specials. We also discussed um, how to make services um, more, more available where EL students are more likely to utilize them and make services more appealing to our EL population to limit service refusal and increase achievement. Um, so those were... Yeah, some of the topics that we discussed, and it's yeah, and we we did discuss some um, capacity and uh, yeah. It's interesting to think about service refusal. I don't know if I've ever heard information on how many students we recommend for services that the parents choose not to pursue those services because they do have the right to refuse. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, I mean, I we, I did ask uh, Renee, you know, like why are students refusing or why are parents refusing, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, just sometimes it's, you know, the, the parents went through that and um, it's not, they didn't have a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, not through th what we're offering, but through what they- Their own Their own, their own experience. experiences, you know, uh, 20 years ago or whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we also discussed, uh, you know, if, if you're in an EL program, uh, a lot of times you're going to a school outside of your, you know, your neighborhood. Outside of your neighborhood. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different things that. Um, it's interesting. They need to, to look yeah. into. So, and Renee said she would. Okay. So. 
I'll let you hit Tyler first. <laughs> well, um, I have another comment also, so do you want me to combine? Sure. Okay, I'll combine. Um, so first of all, um, yeah, it was it was great because uh, a student named Tyler who apparently uh, remembered when I came to visit, I did a site visit at when he was at Murphy, he's now at Oswego East, and he wanted to come and talk about uh, presenting for discussion on the consolidation of non-unified districts with redirection, and he remembered, he remembered my whole uh, speech on uh, the various uh, school districts in the state of Illinois because as I have often told people this is what makes Illinois the unicorn right is uh, where other states have pensions like ours other states have property tax issues like us but what Illinois does that is unique and what apparently stuck out to Tyler is Illinois is the only state that has pre-k through eight school districts nine through 12 school districts and pre-k through 12 school districts and it creates lots of havoc with lots of things uh and so what tyler wanted to do though tyler also had on his mind um mental health and so what he wanted to do was take the savings um that we could um have from that and uh, redirect those funds towards uh mental health and and he wanted to talk about discussion of current bills related to schools education and um, um, he was bringing some of that and from the student advisory committee which I thought was fascinating um, I always use the example I like to keep it right here in Kendall County and so I always use the example of my formal former rival Newark right so Newark has uh, I believe um, well they have two school districts but technically there's three school districts with a Newark address if you uh, consider another pre-k uh, pre through um, eight district down there. And uh, Dr. Sparlin, I'm pretty sure if we combined uh, all three of those superintendents, uh, sorry, but they probably make more than you. And uh, the student population of all three of those school districts is, I don't even know if it would fill one of our schools. But I don't, I don't think it would. I don't think it would either. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but nonetheless, uh, Newark, sorry my former bitter rival. Uh, but my other piece was I, on November 11th, um, I had the opportunity to do a site visit. Uh, I, I was at Oswego High School. I was actually supposed to do three, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it was great, um, very positive environment. Uh, I got to interact with a lot of students. Few were uh, uh, delivering donuts and coffee that day because uh, of the shortened day. Um, so that was awesome, got to interact with them. While I got to witness freshman band, um, uh, parents, sorry, I got a sneak peek at some of the uh, holiday music there, you're in for a treat, uh, but I don't know how they do it, because wow, is that, that place is, is, is jammed, and I was very impressed, to say the least. Um, uh, hats off also to the student services. That was fun also. Um, it was amazing, I feel like, uh, Kevin, what is it, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Is that the old saying? Because there was somebody there who we were talking about some, you grew up in the area, you, you, it's amazing how many people you know. Uh, and then I had to, I was supposed to go to Oswego East and another place, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna brag. Um, this isn't the only capacity I volunteer. I'm also uh, part of the, I'm a GAR commissioner, for those that don't know, Grand Army of the Republic Museum in Aurora. And we got it done. We finally, uh, monumental uh, occasion, the Century is back on the GAR Museum in Aurora. So people from Aurora, uh, that's, that's big news. It's finally done and uh, we're pretty proud. Uh, November 11th, uh, of course, was there for the parade and uh, uh, World War II veteran who's been a uh, longtime resident of Aurora has been asking for it for I don't know how long now and um, we, uh, the fellow commissioners, we're a very proud day to say the least, and the least we could do to honor um, our veterans. So, uh, busy day on the 11th. Thank you. So, we, uh, we also had Tyler at our table. Um, Tyler stayed for both sessions at our table. We had a, we let, um, we let Jeremy Bell and um, Ken Miller take a run at him. <laughs> it was very entertaining, for sure. Um, you know what, he held his own for a 17-year-old kid. I was impressed. Um, but we also had Dr. Kincaid and Dr. Paul 
Um, we talked about a variety of things, including the increase. Um, we talked about his bills. And then um, we talked about, you know, what you should and shouldn't say when you're presenting to certain people um, and groups. And then we also talked about um, increasing capacity for student voice um, and how to get that into the school community and how to reach out to groups that are not necessarily in your group. Like we kind of, we, you know, we took several runs at Tyler and he held his own. Um, just, you know, like if you run with the all honors crowd, you know, do you, you know, what, what's your interaction with the non-honors crowd? Or with the athletes, if you're not an athlete, right? And how to reach out to other sets of kids. Um, we talked about a need for increasing the different types of kids in the advisory committee so that it wasn't just, you know, I'll, I don't want to say top 10 percenters, but you know what I mean? Like, you need a variety of kid. Um, and then we also talked about digital platforms and um, so, I don't know, Dr. Kincaid, where would we go with that? We talked about, you know, some positives, some negatives, some, some others, ways of what we could and couldn't say and should and shouldn't say. And do you have anything to add? It was fun. It was a good time. I actually had a really good time. I learned a lot from the people at my table. We didn't see you at our table either. But no, I was I was at all. I remember there was we, only three rotations. Remember? We we made so we I made had, do, Latanya. We made do. I had EL. I had yeah. finance, yeah. and I had special yeah. ed. So yeah. can I? That was a forty-five minutes. You hit my table. And, and I had DEI, so I got to four different tables. If you so maybe fun. just take a table yourself. Yeah. Well, there were only th there was we had yeah. seven board members, remember, yeah. and there were six tables. So, yep. Um, maybe we could split I some of those so that, like at our table, we only had room. Just feedback: uh, we only had room for two members of the community to even sit at our table because we had four administrators. It might I'll be have, worth splitting bigger tables. I'll have, to, I'll have to keep that in mind for later because I, I said we I set it up for six so. Make sure we do seven next time, maybe. Yeah, we'll figure cool. it out. Can I just, this is real quick, Ed. So I, just to the members of the community, this, what what we just reported out were actual discussions with other community members and that came to the event. So please um, come. This is your chance to give a voice. Yeah, you know, let's make this a robust um, experience and, and can make a lot of change, so. Very good. Anya and Caitlin, are you going to talk a little bit about what Ms. Swanson just talked about, how we're tr working on expanding our committee? Because the question we had at the beginning was, who isn't represented at the table and what you're going to do? You, are you guys going to talk about that in your report? OK, okay great. Good. So then let's go to 7.3 uh, board committee reports. So we just have one tonight. That would be the equity committee. Uh, yeah, so, so just some quick notes. Uh, sorry, I might be all over the place, but uh, we talked about English learners. That's an ISBE term, Illinois State Board of Education term. Um, talked about the current multilingual enrollment, which I like that term better and a lot. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, it's at 12%, which is a little over 2,000 students. I like both of those numbers. I like to know the percent and the total number. However, another piece to add to this is that 20% of our students are really um, what we should look at because that's former and current. Um, and no, it is not, um, it is, does not include English speakers who are in the dual language program. Um, kind of wanted to know as far as like, hey, you know, how many would we need to know or how many would we be looking at if um, we were looking at another language for, you know, exploring another language for dual language other than Spanish, and we aren't anywhere near in the other languages because you really need probably at least 20 at a, at a school um, and at a grade level, so it's, we're not at anywhere close. Uh, we actually have tons of high school growth, move-ins, um, and I like the term multilingual enrollment. Anyone who is thinking about trying to, um, you know, and this kind of ties into the conversation you were having over here about um, experiences, 
the vast majority of our ELs are actually born in the United States. And when we talk about like multilingual education, I think sometimes we have, some of us, some people, have kind of um, maybe, maybe um, a misunderstanding, I'll say it that way. You know, like learning, parts of our education really uh, lend themselves to multilingualism. Like for instance, learning an instrument, right? You're basically learning another language, right? Um, our DHH uh, program, um, it's, you're really learning another language, you know, you're really multilingual. Um, and so uh, math, I, I would argue math, you're really learning another language, right? And so multilingualism really is kind of a, a, a gateway to, um, you know, an avenue, I guess, is a better way to, to um, opening up, if you will, towards uh, many facets when it comes to education. And so trying to regress or retreat in any kind of um, opportunities that we're giving students in multilingualism would be a grave mistake. Um, that said, uh, we did talk about Boulder Hill being having problems recruiting on the English side for dual language. Um, we also talked about what to do about the fact that we're growing, right? We, we talked about, hey, our EL population is growing. Um, so what does that mean as far as space for, for dual language, right? Do we need to open up a third site um, or do we need to find space um, in the two sites that we have now? Um, talked a little bit about, uh, and speaking of space, um, we had some parents who came in and, and had concern about the space that we're using um, over in Hunt Club. And um, I mean, I know we do have internal classrooms kind of that sit not near a window. Um, and I know that we might have situations where we have to utilize those classrooms, but utilizing those classrooms for students that are um, in those classrooms all day, I would think would be probably something we should look into as a last resort. Um, we also talked about Murphy piloting EL studies, listening, speaking, and writing. Um, that came up and um, still talking about, uh, another parent came in and talked about concerns with collaboration with teachers. Um, still concerns again with the junior high level. So if, if you notice, <laughs> right, there's a lot of conversation on elementary, there's a lot of conversation on high school and move-ins, but what gets left out, right? And there's that junior high piece again. And that continues to be a concern for me um, that we leave that out. And, and I've, I've talked about this before. I, I think one of the things that we do right from the beginning is we create constructs against junior high, whether we realize it or not. Um, we have a kindergarten through fifth grade um, construct, right? You spend six years in your elementary school. We have a nine through 12 construct where you spend four years, and then you have a six through eight where you spend three years. And so right away from a facility standpoint, um, you know, and, and we're not the only ones that do it. It's pretty, you're gonna find that in, in a lot of places, right? But right from the beginning, uh, from a resource allocation and a facility piece, we've, we, we do this, I think, unintentionally. And so um, the conversations tend to gear more towards high school and, and elementary, and, and those are important years. And, and what we're doing there, I think, is, is important as well. And, and I, don't like, I don't want that to get lost in, in all of this. So, um, so yeah, that's what I have. So, um, you want to add? Yeah, please. Yeah, there's just, please. A, just one other thing to add. And I, I bring this up often is um, with 20% of our population as EL or former EL, it's kind of its own district. You know, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's big. It's a large population of students. And they need, you know, the proper supports and interventions um, to represent their needs, and that's something that we've just got to get better at. Um, I also went. I went to Boulder Hill. They had me come in and put on a uh, referee uniform. That was too tight for me, but it was fun. You know, I got to show off my belly. Um, and you know, I sat with uh, the teachers, and they, they talked about uh, 
um, oh, the, um, it, you know, emergency situations and different scenarios, and that was interesting. And then we actually, I sat with first grade MTSS, and um, Ms. Jones gave me a tour, and um, yeah, I brought goodies, and you know, it was a lot of fun. Um, learned a lot. So, and, and she, uh, uh, well, I, I should say, man, man, there's a lot of energy uh, with the staff there. It's great, yeah. It's good staff. Thank you. All right, 7.4, Student Ambassador Report. Okay, hi everyone. So. Um, I feel like we've been talking about the finalization of this Google Form application for the student advisory for like many, many weeks, but it's finally finalized and it was sent out today via email to the student body. The due date for this application is November 22nd, so although it's coming up soon, we're really excited to um, get responses. So as a reminder, our committee currently has three people from OHS and four from OE. And we want to include as many perspectives and student voice as possible. Um, and we felt the best way to do this was to get more students on our committee. Um, we will also hold group interviews on November 30th as the next step in our application process to finalize this committee. We look forward to hearing the responses and making additions to this committee. Yeah. And adding on to that, as was discussed earlier, we do want to explore the various aspects of mental health including two-way collaboration between students and faculty, academics, and other realms. So uh, through our SSC open applications and the group interviews that Caitlin just expanded on, we hope to have a better understanding of these different dimensions of mental health that we need to address, and we're hoping to do that with a more multifaceted committee that has more voices and very different perspectives than just the ones that we have now. Um, additionally, several members of our existing uh, and alumni student advisory committee are preparing for the panel we're on this year for the Triple I Conference hosted by the Illinois Associ Association of School Boards in Chicago. Um, the students attending this panel will be meeting this Thursday to finalize our presentation for the conference with Dr. Waller, um, and we'll be talking about the work we've accomplished last year and how our committee aims to represent an extremely widespread and diverse student body. We're expanding our presentation to, to discuss some of the more core values we want to emphasize to other attendees, including two-way communication between administration and students, emotional correctness, and safe spaces. So we're excited to attend and relay some of the insight we receive and the experiences we gain there. This is a new opportunity for us, so we're really looking forward to it, and we wanted to thank you guys for giving us this amazing opportunity. Great. Just to add one more piece is in regards to expanding the team, their entire conversation started around who's not represented. And that was a hour long conversation. And so even every question that was crafted, how it was crafted, um, that's a part of this new Google form, is the goal is to ensure that we are capturing people who have, or, or students um, whose voices and are not represented at the table, so that that's the only group of people that really that we're selecting from, uh, or that they are selecting from when they uh, select this next uh, set of students to be a part of the advisory council. And I think um, I think we can all say that we we want to see that diversity. I would just wonder if you would consider how you what the application process looks like because you know how some people may not be good at interviewing maybe they or they might not be good at an essay or whatever this application process is maybe they want to do spoken word or maybe they want to do a rap or maybe they, what there's all sorts of ways to reflect how they can be confident in the process and so i would ask that you could open it up maybe not this time but maybe going forward so that it's, it's more conducive to how people want to present themselves. Yeah, and a big part of how we structured our current application is, I think one of the biggest ones, we tried to keep the Google form really short. Um, we do have a free response question. It was like three to four sentences because I do recognize that like one, you know, a lot of us don't have time to write some sort of like 500 word essay. I'm writing 500 word essays for college and that's not fun. So I, we get it. So I think that was like a really big part of it too that we were trying to consider, um, that people have different strengths. Maybe that's not writing, right? So we said just kind of be honest. You know, it doesn't have to be some sort of like fancy literary artwork. Um, and I think another thing that we tried to consider with the group interviews is that 
while you don't have to be good at interviewing, because that's definitely, I think, like a very specific kind of skill, um, it's definitely good to have someone who's willing to engage in a conversation. So the group interviews are supposed to be more of like a conversation, seeing how do you initiate a conversation, how do you contribute to one, but that's, that's really good advice. And I think in our future, like ways that we conduct these interviews with the fact that we're both leaving, I definitely like to give that insight to mm -hmm. our current SAC and see if we can <coughs> put in more of those aspects for different ways yeah. to see how applicants can be. A, I vid even a video see, application. Yeah, because yeah. I even yeah. see like when, you know how when you guys came in the room, we were all sitting here yeah. and that, that's not, a, that, it didn't feel, it doesn't feel like a conversation when it's set up like that. Yeah. So you know how they talk about community circles. Maybe you might want to consider when you do have your interview process that you do it in a community circle atmosphere. No, no little eyes, no big eyes. Everybody is equal on equal footing. That you're, you know. I mean, you guys can even sit on the floor because that's what you guys do. The other stuff you guys do. You know what I'm saying? I'm just yeah. saying. Just make it so that it feels more like a conversation. I like that. Thank you. All right. Eight point one consent agenda. Are there any questions on the consent agenda? The, I've got one. All right, go we're, ahead. We're taking questions on 8.1 and 8.2, right? Both of them? Or you just want 8.1? Let's just start with 8.1. No questions on 8.1. Okay, minutes from the previous meeting. That would have been that November 7th meeting. All right? And then how about 8.2? Oh, oh. And again. Gesundheit. I only got one more language left. Um, yeah, uh, gap in FOIAs. Can somebody, th there seems to be a gap in the FOIAs. Can I get an explanation on that one, please? Yeah, we had a FOIA that we developed a response for, and when we sent that response, um, the email, it bounced back, and we contacted the company, and we said, where else can we send this? It ended up the person who requested that information was a intern. That intern had left. And so we provided a response, but it never went anywhere. And so we kept it off the website. Um, and it, uh, we ended up adding it to the website, but then realized that we didn't bring it to the Board of Education. So we're bringing that to you today. Um, if there is a gap in the numbers, uh, what happens is a FOIA is received, and we, no matter what, right away, we automatically give it a number to say that it's been documented, and if there's any reference to this, but some FOIAs in the process, uh, people say, oh, you know what, that was public information or we got that information somewhere else. We don't need a response for that. So they withdraw the FOIA. So if you see a gap between like, we always, num the way the numbers work, it's like the school year 2022. Um, so it's 22 dash 38, 39, 40, 41. If there's a gap, it's because we, we assigned a number, but we never gave a response. So there's 2238, and then there's 2240, and then of course it jumps quite a few numbers. So yep. there was one that was sent back. What is the other one? Just took a while to respond, or? Yeah, some of them are uh, 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 asking for clarification, or the the request is voluminous. So we respond back and say that we can't provide you with a response because it's it's too much information. You can narrow your search. So sometimes a FOIA can take you know three weeks uh, from the time someone turns it in until we respond. Sometimes it can take three months, depending on how voluminous and, and our, our interactions with that person. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? I make a motion to approve all items under consent including 8.1 minutes from the Board of Education meeting on October 24, 2022, open and closed session, and the special closed session meeting on October 25th, 2022, the Board of Education public forum on November 7, 2022, and 8.2 to acknowledge the four requests request received by the district. Second. Ms. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Swanson? Mr. Cerrone? Aye. Ms. Simulton? Aye. Mr. Gatewood? Aye. Mr. Plover? No. Did you say nay? Aye. Sorry. Oh, okay. Motion passes 6-0. Item 9.1 is information on financial statements. Does the board have any questions on what has been presented this evening? Um, yeah. Hold on. Give me one second, well, sorry. 
while he finds it. I noticed yeah, we started to put some of the Nikor stuff together and some of the, a little bit more with the types of services. I'm just, oh wait, that's not this one, that's the next yeah. one. Yeah, Sorry. I, that's what I thought too, yeah. that's the next one I have it's too. It's the next so. one I gotta, yeah. <laughs> I just, like I really just want that in mm -hmm. code together. Any, Instead any of having other to questions? dig through 300 pages, yeah. Okay. This one's not it though. Very good. And Item 9.2 is information on a potential cyber bullying contract. Uh, we have Dr. Petsky along with our directors of technology, uh, Brent Kiger and Kevin McDonald, who are here to present this evening. So, Brent and Kevin? Or is it just Brent? Kevin ran out to get some power supply. We'll be back shortly. Is it cyberbullying or cybersecurity? Cybersecurity. Security, okay. For asking that, well, I was looking at this myself. Yeah. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, uh, we are here tonight to discuss cybersecurity. Um, our presentation will go over what cybersecurity is, what we have in place currently, and a proposed solution to strengthen our cybersecurity stance within the district. Well, a big, big push right now is physical security for the staff and students. We also need to be aware of the importance of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity might mean something different to each one of you. For us, it means protecting all of the district digital resources from unauthorized access and preventing data leakage of any and all personal identifiable information. It also means preventing any digital threat that may negatively impact the learning environment. You can see by this slide that there are many methods in which an, a, an attack can occur. While we have some tools in place to prevent some of these attacks, there is still room for improvement. The most notable fact when looking at the top 10 list is item number six. It states that the education industry is ranked last in cyber preparedness. Here you can see some of the numbers uh, related to a cyber attack. Uh, the average cost of a data breach in education in 2020 was $3.58 million. The average time to identify a breach is 207 days, and the average time to contain a breach is, is 73 days. The education sector was the most sought out uh, for cyber attacks in 2021 and 2022 compared to every other industry, including healthcare and finance. The most recent notable mention of an attack in Illinois was Lincoln College. Uh, which had to close down permanently due to the inability to register students and continue classes. This was due to their infrastructure being down for prolonged periods of time you know, during the initial attack and the attempted recovery process. Another shocking statistic is that in 2021, 67 separate ransomware attacks impacted 954 schools and colleges. These incidents cost the schools more than $3.5 billion in downtime. Here are some of the security measures that we currently have in place. Most of these solutions in place are looking at the end user and application level. We want to expand upon these services with a solution to detect and respond to any network threat that may come from a breach at any level and any source. With the increase of cyber attacks happening within the educational space, and the drastic increase of technology being used within our district since COVID, the time to implement a solution is now. 
Over the past few years, we have been looking for a solution that would give us the items listed on this slide. The proposed solution we will be discussing tonight covers all five of these items. Real-time threat detection, artificial intelligence and automated threat response, taking a proactive approach versus a reactive approach, uh, 24 by 7 by 365 coverage, and a security team to analyze all the anomalies that it finds. Okay, so what did we do to try and address these needs in order to take the next step? We formed a five-member committee with members from our network and systems team that researched and reviewed multiple vendors. When we started to narrow down, we were involved with multiple demonstrations of their product. And then when we came up with the product that we decided upon, we engaged with them with a proof of value where they brought their product on our site and we were able to take a test drive of that product and then speak to them about how to use that product. We also visited the facility that would be providing different security services. When comparing the vendors, we had criteria that we compared against and I wanted to point out a couple that uh, we felt were very important. Uh, first of all, the integrations. We needed some product that worked with what we already had. Uh, the AI and automation, we felt it necessary uh, that it did have some type of automation that would cut down on the time to respond to a threat. And then we also wanted to check the boxes on the cyber insurance survey uh, qualification survey that specifically asked if we had a SIEM, which is a uh, security information and event management tool, and or a SOC, uh, which is a security operations center. The vendor that we worked with, uh, we wanted to build a working relationship. Uh, we wanted them to be an extension of our team. And uh, probably one of the most important, we want them available. Uh, cybersecurity does not happen 8 to 5, 9 to 5, wherever. More than likely, it's happening at the most inopportune moment. So the first part of this uh, solution was dark trace, uh, which will help us detect and respond, uh, mainly detect, but it is a hardware software solution that will monitor all network traffic in and out of the district along with any traffic across the district. What it monitors, it will be able to formulate a behavioral profile um, which uh, is ever-changing depending on the network traffic that it finds and then it will alert when it finds something that is acting abnormal. Uh, one feature of this particular product that uh, basically compared to the rest, took it above and beyond. It also has the ability to automatically respond and isolate a threat should this uh, threat become severe enough. What this didn't quite address um, that we felt was needed was the human involvement. And that's where Fortis uh, services, security services provided by Sentinel comes in. They will be providing a security operations center uh, for the district. Of course, they are manned 24 by 7 by 365. They will be ingesting all uh, our server logs and uh, other logs from our infrastructure and analyze those for various anomalies. They will also maintain the dark trace solution, not only because they have the resources, but also because many of their clients already use their product, uh, the dark trace product in their um, security stance. We will have a dedicated team uh, to our environment, which will learn our environment and be able to react appropriately. We also will use their skill set uh, in their vast knowledge with uh, threats that are in the wild uh, I can dare say that if we do get attacked, they will probably already have encountered it and know how to mitigate the, uh, the, uh, the threat of that. 
we also will be meeting with their team on a regular basis to review what they find and their recommendations so in conclusion we believe that the two components dark trace and the fortis security operations center provides a unified solution that will be able to proactively detect and stop a threat and provide the information to appropriately mitigate and prevent future threats from occurring in the ever-changing landscape of cybersecurity, the combination of the two solutions is a necessity to help protect SD-308 now and into the future. Yeah. You have questions? Sorry. I have, I have uh, just a few. Um, so you brought up uh, in cybersecurity insurance, um, and this is something that they obviously want you to check the box on to be able to bring premiums down, but I'm assuming the premium deduction wouldn't be near the cost of this. Is that, what do you anticipate saving on insurance, I guess? We asked our insurance provider, they could not give us detail as to what it may reduce so our, our deductibles. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming our cybersecurity, what, what, what do we pay per year for? You know what? I'd have to look into that for you. But, yeah, sorry, uh, I didn't. The uh, interesting thing that is, in it first. was greatly so increased cool. this year. So we had a, there was a huge spike in cybersecurity protection the last uh, the last year. My my first review. So I can get that information for you. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, just a just a side note too. Uh, more and more articles that I read that are security based and in the education and in part of the uh, insurance uh, application process. Some of them are now n having or they need you to have these solutions in place before they'll even insure you. Do you know if that's true of our insurer though? Our insurer? I'm not sure, no. But I just know that that's the direction that it's headed. So are you, so are you basically uh, suggesting that all school districts are have this and we're kind of lagging or? I think we'd be ahead of, ahead of the curve. So this would be uh, ahead of the curve, this. okay. Correct. Um, hardware so this includes hardware what what are the sensors that it uh, in order to appropriately detect it and knowing how much network traffic we have it does include two servers one at each of our data centers and then virtual servers uh, at every site that we have so all of those will feed into a master server so the physical hardware aspect will be the two servers at each of our data centers, which happens to be at each of the high schools. Okay. Um, how many districts are using uh, Fortis and DarkWave? Uh, I don't specifically have a number. Both companies gave us references uh, of different school districts uh, that do use the product. I specifically don't know uh, the combination but both of them have an experience with education and um, I don't know if you can tell me a little more about the proof of value uh, sure uh, they were <laughs> able to provide a, a physical server and we were able to install it in our environment uh, let it run detect um, what network traffic we had in the environment, be able to alert, uh, and we had regular scheduled meetings with them to review what it did find and how we might uh, appropriately mitigate those uh, fines. Uh, it lasted, this was back in the spring, um, I think it lasted about 60 days that we had their equipment in house. Okay, it's, it's not thoughts. a little, so yes, yeah, so I don't. Yeah. I think I'm, um, I'm done with my questions, yeah. How many other companies did you take this opportunity to explore? We researched many. We narrowed it down to mainly two that we took it the next step, trying to test drive their software. All right, and what was the, the difference on this one versus that you felt was a stronger candidate? The, the biggest aspect, honestly, was the ability to automatically isolate um, the 
offending threat and potentially isolate it from propagating throughout the district the other product it it might be able to find that and it did have some of that behavior technology in it but it wasn't able to isolate it thank you let me just ask my last question first because I just asked the one or two it's yours okay so come on back to me though yeah okay so my my question to that one is how much of your time right now is spent on these isolating of these random ransomware are we even capable right I don't know that that's necessarily beneficial for the school district to to share yeah feel free to say no really this is a topic you don't want to talk too much about I would definitely agree with that thought process but let's also throw out there that part of this package is a security operation center that is 24 7 we don't have the staff to do those types of things can I ask another question so this isn't something that we put out to bid like we put out other contracted services so I guess my question is why not and I don't know that that's a question for you guys and then also did you have this budgeted in I know we've heard presentations when we went with this one-to-one did was this a cost that was budgeted in to our projections yeah we've been looking at solutions like this for the last couple of years and because we haven't been able to act upon it immediately we have the proof of value back in April we put it in our budget and yes it is approved for this year's budget okay thanks and the history just to answer the other like why did it not go out to bid it basically comes down to technology where we have a very specific environment and we have a very specific service level that we require in order to keep that up and running and integrate and the qualifications of the company so the state of Illinois does not require us to bid or go with the lowest lowest bid in terms of technology but like you heard these guys say we did we did have them go out to multiple vendors so rather than just taking one that we liked we had them come up with a matrix they did only go with two but I know they have been dealing with me too I also in a previous district had done this with cybersecurity evaluation with three other companies so based on where the three other companies plus the two that we did I was very comfortable with what they were adopting I think the big thing too is and I don't know if it's quite so clear but none of the other companies or solutions are autonomous this will actually develop a traffic picture and a profile of what's normal and automatically make decisions if if it requires another level of service then it will upgrade to Fortis who will then watch that traffic and find out what's going on or why did the automated traffic monitoring key this or flag this and then Fortis will contact us so there's a there's a 24 7 365 automation which is absolutely phenomenal yeah. Yeah. and the, oh, the yeah. price difference between this and the others is not that big of a difference from that what was we're getting. so okay but my you answered partially a question that made me think of this follow-up which is have you worked with one of these two or both of these in previous districts uh, no I've worked with uh, I've worked with two others that were not very good <laughs> okay thanks <clears throat> he, so the kind he, of sorry oh. kind of answered my question on I don't I don't know how to ask it without just asking it um, the cost difference between this and what we're currently doing uh, that's what's interesting is uh, at this level we we don't have a system at this level and that's why when these gentlemen were talking to me about their budget and budget needs we ended up building this into the budget because we did not have a solution um, they actually told me about it the first year and we could not fit it into the budget um, the second year we were able to fit it into the budget we'll continue to do that as we move forward please do yeah. <laughs> yes. and the history of this company like we're confident that they are going to be around and we're not going to have situations like we got with some other stuff we got going on 
Yes, both, both companies have been around. One of them was 30 plus years in existence, so they're not going anywhere. Um, and the other company is very uh, well uh, established. Yeah, exactly. Can I, Thank you. can I ask a question about that, though? So, how I realize this is more cybersecurity than maybe it touches on the grading part. Like, so how, if we pick it now and then we have to change our grading system? How do we know that it will still interface with the new? Are you talking about you're talking different? about Tyler? This is that's oh, a Tyler's different a, item. Tyler's a hot mess right now. Yeah, right. I'm no, just asking if this like listen when I hear so AI confused. and yeah. traffic, like I'm starting to think you know no, honestly like this is it's a good question, but this is our environment in terms of switches and networking and servers, not so right. much the cloud based. This is not how have. Facebook finds it, out what I Google. It does monitor the traffic the in and out to those cloud based <laughs> solutions, but it doesn't matter if we have one system or another in terms of student information or finance systems. It's going to monitor the types of traffic that is going across our district to those cloud based uh, systems. Don't we? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming we do, but. Um, don't we require our SaaS solutions and cloud-based solutions to have this type of security? And and where are we? Maybe I shouldn't ask that. So, but yeah. so that's that's built in the contracts. This is just additional. Yeah, and that's for like hacking and uh, and you know we're we're talking like ransomware and all the other cyber attacks that could happen um, or the types of traffic okay. denial of service. So there's like these guys said on so the not first just slide. There's there's not just cloud-based. A ton of, right. Okay. That's what they said across the district. They're monitoring what's going from Murphy to uh, Trauber, what's going from Trauber to the Wheatlands across our district as well. So. Right, but didn't we have an issue at the beginning of the year where some of the, some of the, not tech classes, but some of them here couldn't get their computers to interface with what we had going on? Some of the digital arts and the, there was some kind of, that's totally different too? Yeah. Correct. Hmm. The, the one thing I know, Dominic, just your question about how many districts does this, uh, um, does this company deal with? Um, not, a, not a lot of school districts are using this automated system yet. What really impressed me though is when Brent and Kevin showed me the number of, uh, the number of uh, industries that were using this, so in terms of financial and HR and uh, other companies and how they're protecting them, their references were top notch. So, so yeah, so if it's financial, then that's, if it's a financial, it's a high very highly regulated and generally anybody doing business with them have to be uh, pretty top notch. Um, okay. What was the second, second place or the other one? What was the cost? Cost? The, the cost of the one that um, that, you didn't that you bypassed. You don't have to say the cost; just say the difference. Oh, the difference. What's yeah. the difference? Um, it was about the main component of the other vendor that we were looking at. It was a little bit cheaper, um, probably about eighty percent to ninety percent of. Uh, what the final cost of this was. Okay. But what was it missing? I'm sorry? But it was missing... The autonomous piece. It was piece missing, and the, it was missing the autonomous, piece. and honestly, uh, a lot of... It, their, the option for the um, security, or the SOC, the Security Operations Center, this was more of the software component, not so much the services component. There was also some integrative uh, components that were missing on the second vendor. Uh, the first vendor integrated very well with our existing uh, firewall and network infrastructure, so it would be able to tie in directly with it and uh, uh, stop those threats in its track. It'll automatically add rules to our firewall to block certain traffic if it senses that it's uh, malicious in intent. So that this solution that we're proposing ties in directly with a lot of our existing uh, components so we wouldn't have to upgrade or purchase additional licenses for it to work. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Any other questions for 9.2? All right, item 9.3 is an informational report on vendor and contracts that Dr. Petsky and his team have been working on. So, Dr. Petsky? Yeah, this is uh, an evolution, or I guess an artifact of what we've been talking about, but it sounds like we got some other questions on this. 
So uh, what I'm presenting to the Board of Education um, is building on what we did last year. Uh, last year we had about 23 contractual agreements and 60 vendor partnerships that I brought to the board. Um, and this year, you know, after we had that list and presented to the board, I also shared that with our district departments and administration. And I said, here's what the business office is aware of in terms of the, the contracts and vendor relationships that you have. Is there anything you would like to add to this? Anything you want to tell me about? And uh, we ended up gathering a lot of other information on there as well. So we went from 23 contracts to now we're up to 74 contractual agreements. And instead of 60 vendors, we added 100, we now have 140 vendors reflected in here for a total cost of about $75 million worth of contracts and vendor spending. Keep in mind, uh, one note I said on this is we could have a contract that's like five years long. So while 75, that's not $75 million a year, that could be one contract that we have for five years that's like, um, that's uh, $25,000 a year or uh, for five years, $125,000. So it's cumulative. Um, and uh, what I did then as well is I've got the vendor contracts, how much our vendors and contracts listed, how much we cumulatively spent, what those, and so if there's a, a C in the contract column, that means there's a contract with that company and what the amount is, and in the initial department kind of categories, what that is. So the first one on your list, you can see locked-in companies. They work with us on our benefits, and they've got a cost of $125,000 on that contract. Um, so in addition to that, I've got companies who are listed as vendors. So we have a vendor, uh, Deer and Company. We don't have a contract with them, but they also work towards our or service our benefits and they're kind of a vendor as we pay as we go they have reached a limit that the board is asked to see in this case they're at forty one thousand dollars and uh, uh, so they made the list because they're over that twenty thousand dollar mark that we've purchased or that we've spent with them so far so a lot of the costs that you see in the contracts and vendors those are built into the budgets for the departments so these aren't like new these are not new, uh, new relationships and new vendors that we're using. Uh, these are ones that different departments expect to be using. And I think the last thing I wanted to say about this, oh, for example, uh, one question that came up was about the different schools. We had five schools buying paper from three different vendors. Um, and when we looked at that, those three different vendors were Amazon, Quill, and Vertiv. And what we do is we look at the prices. It's not so much the vendors, it's how much are people paying. And what we did notice is with Amazon, we could get a box of paper for $35, where when we go with Quill or Vertiv, it's 41. So our recommendation is going to be to communicate out to the schools and say, hey, if you need paper, please buy from Amazon. They're a little bit cheaper than the others. Um, so that we were getting the best cost. And the other thing that we'll be monitoring, of course, the other thing the board was asking is if we buy in greater volumes, um, if, we, if we can get a better pricing. The problem with that is if we store that much paper in a non-environmentally controlled environment, then it jams our copiers. So we'll look at that. Um, what you'll notice is Quill, or Amazon, I don't believe are on this list, or at least Quill is not on this list. They're just a vendor. We have not reached spending $20,000 with them, so they're not on this list. They will if we end up buying cumulatively throughout the year more than $20,000. And that's what I told the board I would bring them is uh, in consent agenda, I would say like new new vendors who've reached the twenty thousand dollar mark and in consent you'll just see if there's any vendors that we we now are spending you know maybe right now with quill we're only spending eight thousand dollars but by the end of four quarters it'll be thirty two thousand as soon as they hit that twenty thousand dollar mark i will alert the board that here's another vendor to add to our list so this is a is this a snapshot in time like so for the first mm -hmm. one the dollars I'm looking at, this is what we spent to, to date? Yeah, these are what we spent uh, this year so far with these 
contracts and with these vendors, or I'm sorry, with the vendors, with the contracts, that's, um, that's the contract that, and I'm looking at this, I couldn't tell you right now if that's a, a one year, two year, three year, four year contract at that cost. So the other thing I can add to this is if it is a contract, what's the term yes. of the contract? Yes. So, yeah. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. But the vendors uh, all reflect a cumulative total from the beginning of the year, July 1st, until now, what we've spent with those vendors. So, and so we're only going to see this document when More. another vendor or, con or vendor reaches a threshold? Yeah. Unless, unless the board has some other direction for us. Well, first of all, I think we need to review this some kind of regularly. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to dance around a topic, but I'm also going to be kind of direct at the same point, at the same time. Um, I'm going to try and be cognizant of people, but, um, I have a lot of discomfort right now with, with um, not leadership in here, but leadership in, in the community. Um, there is um, uh, a lot going on that makes me uncomfortable when it comes to how business is done, um, both um, with one of our um, taxing, a few of our taxing bodies and um, this is public knowledge. Anybody can look it up. If you look at the Illinois State Board of um, Elections, you can see that um, we have become, you know, when, when I was growing up, um, one of the things I was taught very, I, I was taught, hey, can't stand Mike Madigan, right? Pay to play. And that's what we've become around here. We've become pay to play. Um, you have people hiding behind LLCs who, if you follow the money, it's very uncomfortable. I think this stuff needs to be reviewed quite often. Um, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with even a situation that we're in where there is definitely um, campaign contributions that, quite frankly, um, one could say are indirectly being funneled indirectly to one of us. Um, and so I think this needs to be reviewed regularly. Um, I'll leave it at that, but, um, and, and what's going on in here needs to be pure. Um, because what's going on with some of our taxing bodies is not. The good news is you don't have anything to fear. It's not going to get covered. I'm keeping track of what's not getting covered in the media. They're not going to, they didn't cover Plainfield giving us the, the, um, SRO for free. They didn't cover the roundabout money being about equivalent to what we got for, um, um, what was it, the um, the money that, you know, the, for the property. The, the, the traffic light? The, well, I don't know why it's escaping me. The, um, whatever, the, the check that was in the, it was in the uh, press. Um, oh, the impact fees. Impact fees, yeah. thank you. They didn't cover that, so. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that, so you don't have anything to worry about. It's not like they're going to cover that either. Um, they're sure as heck not going to cover the LLC piece either and people hiding behind that. Um, but we need to maintain purity here, even if people around us can't. Um, and um, I, I'm very concerned with that. Uh, that's one piece. Um, I'm also curious when it comes to, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll yield here in a second to somebody else, but I did have some specifics. Maxim Health, are we paying paraprofessionals for that? And do we know what the rate pay is if we are, what we pay outsourced for paraprofessionals? We do uh, use Maximum, Maximum Health for some of the paraprofessionals. It's just a handful. And the hourly rate is somewhere around the, between 35 and $40 an hour. Wait. Where's, what's this maximum health? Where is it? It's listed as, it's listed as nurse, uh, specialized as uh, nursing, but I'm, I'm curious now that, like, are there others on here that are labeled otherwise that we're using for paraprofessionals? Ooh, that's a lot of money. Why can't we hire our own? That are labeled something else. 
So I guess I should have put numbers on these. Use? <laughs> hmm? Are you looking to see use? So under it says initial department categories. And if you look that particular one up, it says uh, student services, registered school nurse. But I'm curious if there's others that are labeled either that or something else where we're outsourcing paraprofessionals. Oh. And so that one's 35 to 40. The concern I have is I, I think that rate, so we're outsourcing 35 to $40 an hour for teacher assistance. That's higher than what we're paying some of our school nurses. Is, am I correct in that? How, so how long have we been doing this? Okay. It's been uh, staffing shortages since COVID. I think, uh, Faith, do you know the answer to that? I, was this the first year? I believe that this is the first year we've gone through the teaching assistant piece for through Maxim. Um, I can we've kind double of check out, and get uh, you an some answer. Of the nurses I, for different, different years, but I think this is the first for teaching assistants, isn't that? I correct. believe that to be correct. So, is that, and, and I'm sorry, that, quick like question I, about I've that. I've just been working with uh, Denise. Uh, actually, last week I was working with her because we're, we're talking about how much do we have budgeted for open positions um, compared to what the salary is, but also we have uh, benefits cost in that as well. So what did we budget? And then when we look at these contracts, are we staying within that budget or how much, uh, how much more is it because of the staffing shortage that we're having to pay to use these services versus how much are we using and we're still staying within that budget. So uh, Denise and I are looking at that as well. Just point of clarification for the maximum. So our, I think I heard TAs are being hired or being contracted through them as well. I'm just asking because under the category it says registered school nurses and not TAs. So is it is it a separate line item for the TAs or is it just there are TAs and school nurses under this one budget item. You know, I can check on that one. I would imagine it would be for both, but we just have it listed as uh, student services, registered nurses, but I can take a look. All right, that leads into my one, I'm sorry, somebody oh, go. That leads into my question in regards to the, I think that when I look at the, the form, and I'm thank you for this, because this is helpful. Mm -hmm. This is a good start, I should say. Um, cause the question I, I, the questions that I have is when I had to do a, get this into Excel so that I can manipulate the data a little bit better. And so I think it's the categories because I think the opportunity that we can see if we can make the, the categories a common, um, I don't know, a common category, it will help us to understand not just vendors. Cause when you think about a new vendor being added to the list when we go over a set dollar amount. Mm -hmm. But if the category, I'm giving you an example, um, for example, just, you know, um, special education, we know that the needs that we have and that it's, you know, um, expansive across the dif district. But when you, because there's a separate category at attached to SPED, you know, I had to do some manipulating to get to the point of realizing that that's over 10% of this budget. And so, of course, it's needed, but I just, but I think that we just have to be able to see the total picture. So if a category, even though a single vendor may not reach the threshold of $20,000, there may be 20 other vendors for a particular category that's yeah. not even on this list and that we don't even know and we won't see it, but we're spending quite yes. a bit under a particular category. Right. So I'm just trying to make sure that the efficiencies and, and, and not, not even talking about SPED, but just and when we're talking about spending, whether it's maintenance or landscaping or whatever it is that we're able to say, hey, let's go back to your example for paper, Amazon, you know, the dollar amount associated with that. Hey, we're spending $500,000 across the district in paper. Let's talk about it and, and figure out, is there a way that we can do it that's more efficient? But if the categories are individualized, it will be very hard for us to do those subtotals 
um, to see where we could realize any savings. That's first statement. I'll pause if anybody else has anything else well, to add. One more. To, to piggyback on that, on Jared's statement, if you look down too, there's Birch Agency, Fox Hire, um, Nurse Finders, PDS Staff, the Stepping Stones LLC. There's a bunch of all these other different groups mm -hmm. that are listed as special ed. I assume some of those are TAs, right? But they're all kind of listed under all these different mm -hmm. spots. Uh, they could be providing different special education services, but we don't we don't pay a vendor like we do have some like psychologists, social workers, things of that nature that are are uh, kind of uh, that we we. What's that? It's like a direct contract with them. Yeah, like a direct contract. Yeah. So we probably not all of them. So we have we have several different outsourcing agencies that mm -hmm. we pay to place different different Outplay personnel. students. Like TAs, are we using more than one outsourcing service to place TAs? Are we using more yeah. than one outsourcing service yes. to place? Yes. But they're all jumbled up in here. So okay, mm -hmm. well we need. Can we get that like kind of? Yeah, the cat it's the categories. It's the category. We have to organize yeah, that's the yeah. categories. Like, like you can better. see here, I've got special ed OTPT. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten different contracts for for OTPT, and then we've got. Uh, I saw some social work in there, mm -hmm. and then the nurses, but. Um, like you said, I'm not sure if that one covers nurses only or nurses and TAs. So I can I can clarify that, or I've got that one to clarify already. Yeah, I mean, and as we're cleaning, I guess if there's a description, maybe a description for the category line. I mean, I, I'm not trying to make make extra work, but I think that that's when we will be able to have the conversation about you know what how we can become a little bit more efficient. And then one other question, this is probably just, please excuse my own, my own ignorance. I saw a line on here for Oswego East High School and Oswego High School. I just, I just didn't understand it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, there's, it's like a... Hit control F. 150,000 or something like that, but... Two. Oswego East is page 2, 91,977. I bet and you Oswego that's just, like, intercompany right reimbursements and stuff. 480. But, well, uh, but that kind of speaks to another thing I'd seen where I'd seen some reimbursements to parents. Yeah, on here. Um, on this, and they're listed as vendors. They're not truly vendors, um, it, it's a, it's different circumstances that we do have to reimburse people, but that doesn't necessarily qualify them as a vendor. Yeah, and you know, I'll take a closer look at that one. But my initial thought on that is we collect um, we collect a lot of student fees, activity fees through our our finance system, and then what we do is we pay so we pay the schools their activity fees because that's part of our budget now. So mm -hmm. my initial thought, and I'll follow up on that. My initial thought is that's us paying the schools what we collected in terms of their activity fees or student fees so and yeah, I, don't, I don't know if we um, <coughs> articulated um, kind of the point yeah so um, um, maybe if, Eugene, that's what, if, you, if that's what Eugene uh, is yeah. looking for then are you able to work out a little bit more detail what it is you had in mind because I, yeah, I like I where you're so. going with this and I see the point of it and, and I'd like to give you an opportunity to Make sure that you're getting what you need because I think it could benefit everyone. You mean as far as the the report? What it as would a look whole? like? Yeah. Yeah, I mean the report as a whole. For me, when we were looking at, we're asked to approve a budget, and when we're approving the budget, the per case in point, the initial report that we received was 30 million. This report is 75 million, and so when we're when we're asked to approve an overall budget, but we don't know what we're approving. This helps us to say or had to have confidence that when we are approving a budget that we're confident with what we're saying yes or no to. But when we don't know and we're not sure, then it causes us to pause to say, wait a minute, are there areas where we can be more efficient? Are there and, and, and on it, when we're having conversations, I mean, the, you know, all the administrators are able to say, here's what we're doing, why we're doing it and how we're doing it. But I just want to make sure that we have 
uh, better systems and controls in place because when we have, um, I don't know how many people are, you know, have control to spend this money, but before it was 30 million, now it's 75. So I just think we have to have, make sure we have proper controls in place. And then if, and when those controls are in place, to ensure that we have efficiency so that we can maximize the dollars we have because we don't have any dollars that we cannot. Yeah, because when you do that presentation last week or the last time, mm -hmm. th there was a column that said other and it said $50 million. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, what is that? It's this, and isn't it's it? In, in it's, here, and, yeah. but, but that said 50, but now we're already up to 75. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and note some of that is, like I said, you're, you're kind of mixing the budget and the contracts and vendors. Like a lot of the contracts and vendors are reflected in the they budget. Are. They are. And so what you're asking is, well, you want to, you want to, you know, where I rely on the budget managers, you know, the who's in charge of how much of a budget, um, transportation, buildings and grounds, each of the individual buildings, special ed, regular ed, and uh, uh, the elementary services, things like that. I think what maybe the board would be interested in is like how big of a budget is each budget manager in control of um, oh. That that may that may ultimately like not one person's in charge of the seventy five no, million. I, I get yeah, that. we get that. No, I, I get that, but I'm not even I'm not necessarily asking that. I'm saying, and I I want us to be able to em empower the budget managers. However, there has to be controls in place um, to ensure that when we're spending, um, what percentage of our budget is this? You know, when we're spending, you know, twenty percent of the budget going toward whatever it is that we're just um, that we're just empowering them to, to do it in an efficient way. Yeah. I mean, and there no one's necessarily questioning. We needed to see it before because I don't even know what questions to ask yeah. yet. Well, you know, and I think the other thing I offered the board last time I presented was another way to look at this is not just these vendors, but I could break it down by another uh, another finance organization tool. It's our objects. So for instance, out of all of this, how much is 100? How much is paying salaries? How much is 200 paying benefits? How much yeah. is paying 300, which is that. professional services? And then 400, what is supplies and materials? 500, what's capital outlay? Like I, if you look at a lot of the maintenance stuff there, a lot of that is, um, a lot of that is, well, some of it's supplies and filters and toilet paper and there's bulk salt. You know, we spent $20,000 for bulk salt for our uh, winter time. So uh, I can break it down by some of those object codes to see if there's a, is there an area of spending like office supplies would be in 300 um, or in uh, 400 rather. So it, our, what percent of our budget district wide through these contracts are in the 400s. So that the answer to that would be yes, <laughs> but I don't think that that's all, uh, uh, you know where we would stop. Let me give you a perfect example. It doesn't go to the vendor level. Clarify, is but that we have board policy that states that we're aware of anything, any contract that's with the 20,000. That that policy has been in place for a very long time, and there was a reason why that policy was put in place, um, and it's for awareness, for controls, etc. However, when you look at this, um, as you stated, you've had 10, 15 number, I don't know how many contracts, but after additional research, there were scores additional contracts and hundreds of, or 100, over 100 additional vendors that were identified. And just by us asking questions, we're just identifying how money is being spent. And so I'm just I'm just saying that if if we weren't aware of it pre previously, then this is causing us to say, hey, well, there's obviously we didn't have um, uh, I don't know proper pro whatever in place in order to identify it. So the same reasons and rationales why we're at why we bring contracts to the board for that dollar amount what we talked about at a previous board meeting was that we would also bring vendors who reach that dollar amount and make that a part of the consent agenda so that we have transparency for the community, um, that it's a part of every single board and we're able to just see it. And, and perhaps if it's a new one, we highlight that one so that we don't have to go through, you know, 200 line items each board, 
meeting just to say, hey, here's a new one that, you know, that we've identified that has hit that threshold. But it gives the visibility, because if we don't have the visibility, then there's no way that we can have a conversation about how we should govern accordingly. And another thing too, while you're talking, just another idea that's popping out too, like some of what you see on this list, the reason they are a contractor or a vendor is because we went to bid and we had to select them as the lowest bid. So some of these are non-negotiable. So we could take those out of the mix and say, well, where did you do your due diligence and get the best pricing? Well, we could take all those things that were bid out right off the list because they're all, we had to select lowest bidder. Um, and then, uh, and then that would that would kind of help highlight some of those uh, some of those costs. So what was what was um, bid? Who's the budget manager? What types of expenses are these for? We should be to, taking things off. Narrow down on those categories no. and classifications. I don't, I don't want to take anything off. Well, I don't. No. I mean, I, no. The market is it just was market bid as bid. Yeah, yeah. Right. just market. Right. Because oh, right, I wouldn't take them off. No, oh, okay. I mean, I, you, we uh, could easily sort it, and I could put a column in there yeah. and just say that was bid, so oh, then you could you see them, take it off. but then we could, we could have a conversation about the other ones to say, well, can you do more to get these costs under control? Right, because I think that's what we're looking for, because I yeah. don't know, what, you know who, who determines whether or not we get a contract for XYZ company or whether they're a vendor, like, who determines that? Is, is that is that our is that our role to determine? You know, like when you go out to bid on a certain one of these vendor contracts or not? Or because I I don't I'm not I'm not getting it. I'm yeah, well, if we go out to bid, then we would have a contract with them, so they'd be a contract. But a vendor is like uh, like Amazon. We don't have a contract with Amazon. It's just we have um, we have some good pricing. Like here, looking at other. Depending on, like there, hmm? Depending on the day, but are there? Depending on the day, right? Tomorrow it might not be the lowest one. So are telling there, everyone are to get. Are there vendor contracts or these, just these entities on here? Mm -hmm. There are, are. I'm sure there's some we that we should maybe have a contract with that we don't. And to look at it in terms of efficiencies, you know, keeping everybody honest and making sure we're getting the best pricing, we should look at all of these things to determine whether or not they should be a contract or not. Shouldn't we? If it's our job to, you know, ISB says it's our job to determine who gets what benefits for how much. That's our main, mm -hmm. that's our main One job. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like. Yeah, some of them, and I think that's So we'd I like to know that. Story. However, however you want to structure it, Dr. Petsky, I think yep. just what I'm hearing is maybe work with Eugene a little bit because it seems like he has a good handle on what I think we're all trying to express. Yeah. I know that we try to maintain the 10 minute limit on the conversations if it's possible to, but is there, you know, and, and that's both in questions and responses yes. uh, combined. So, you know, is, is there more that we could offer that, that would give you Dr. Petsky direction in what it is we're trying to do, which is figure out how you're spending our money? Yeah. Yep, um, definitely. And I think you don't need more the finance, clarification? Through our finance facility well, committee. Well, you, you said to you work, work, with, with, work with Eugene. Work yeah. with Eugene. That's, that's what I'm hearing is a, a good idea. Yep. Yeah, that's a great good idea. We can educate you on some of our co-ops. I'd like to talk right. more about that, too. Well, well yeah, because but that's, that's where a whole we different topic. Yeah. So let's try to keep the topics separate. Um, are we done with this piece? Yeah. yeah. I, I'd actually like to make a motion to move the personnel report and vote on it now. You want to vote on the credit? I can explain after if you can you agree with me or disagree. You want to vote on the personnel contract now. Which one? Let me see. Just Let the personnel me. report. Personal 10.5, you're saying? You'd have to have a second at that motion, vote on the motion, and if it passes, then do the vote now. So Jared so, made a motion, right? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll second. Sec oh, go ahead. Whatever. Second. Allie, second. But I'm curious. Miss Simelson? Aye. Miss Swanson? Aye. Mr. Plover? Aye. Miss Doyle? Aye. Mr. Cervone? Aye. Mr. Gatewood? Aye. 
Yeah, I'll go ahead and comment on why I want to vote on the personnel report, because if we look at the personnel report, you'll look specifically and see what we're paying TAs. And after going over the vendor report um, and discussing what we're outsourcing, um, like, we have to address this somehow at some point. I've talked about this ad nauseum, that the things that we think we're doing to save money are actually costing us money, and this is yet another example that we think we're saving money and it's costing us money. I'm all for listening to all perspectives on this, but um, we continue to have these discussions in this district about, yes, we, we, we are stressing out households with activity fees. We are stressing out households over parking situations. We are, um, you know, all these situations that are coming to us and this should be alarming to all of us, right? I am not blaming anyone because I have a feeling that it's a situation where we're just trying to survive with the labor market being the way it is. However, it has to be addressed. Something has to be done because this is costing us money. And that's why I wanted to draw attention to it because I don't want it to be lost on anyone what is going on. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I think that's fine. That's I, yeah. fine if you don't think it is. I, I, I but, but yeah, earlier I asked for kind of to prove that out. It's, you know, to kind of take a look at that and to, you know, categorize and um, just to be, just just to have the proof. You know. Okay. So, so I'm ready to vote. I'm going to call for the vote, Perfect. and then we can have a point of discussion after if we want. I'm done. Yeah. You're done? I don't know that I have anything to discuss. I don't have anything to discuss. Okay. Are you guys done? All right. Mm -hmm. Call for the vote. I recommend it. You could just All right. Um, can I have a motion um, to approve the personnel report? I make a motion to approve the personnel report as presented. Second. Ms. Simelton? Aye. Mr. Ploger? Aye. Mr. Gatewood? Aye. Mr. Cerrone? Aye. Ms. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Swanson? No. All right. So we go back to... Uh, We're going to 9.4. Yeah. All right. Item 9.4 is information on a resolution for property tax appeal interventions. Dr. Petsky? Yeah. This is really a, a blanket resolution uh, that was brought to my attention. Uh, recently, the Property Tax um, Appeals Board um, has changed uh, procedure where typically the procedure used to be as long as uh, a school district and a taxing body were in conversation and talking about coming to a settlement, um, they, could, they could postpone going to trial um, or taking action, but recently now the, uh, uh, the Property Tax Appeal Board is required to intervene within 60 days. And what all that means is if somebody contests their property taxes or if a commercial business does, and I can't even attend the trial to gather information without the potential of calling a special board of education meeting to give me authority to even be a part of those hearings. So this would, uh, this would do that. And the way the resolution is written, as you can see, is that I will not be taking action without bringing it to the board, but at least I can do my information gathering and put a package together that me and our attorney feel is in the best interest of the district and the taxing bodies and, uh, and then decide to, uh, decide to move on that. So we recently did that last year with the Home Depot uh, when they contested their property taxes um, and uh, uh, we went to the attorney on that. So this is a blanket resolution just to say that the Board of Education will allow me the well, authority to determine where intervention is necessary and to, uh, to act on that and bring it to the Board's attention. In here, what, what we were also talking about with this, though, was wasn't this where it was directing with law to file the request to intervene. So this isn't just a blanket authority. It's also... In, from what I'm reading, um, contracting a, a, an attorney. Well, uh, we 
I, I review all, uh, I view all, uh, all of that with Whitlaw anyway. So what this is saying is they would help me if we, you know, we've got 60 days to prepare for trial. I wouldn't be doing that myself. I would be, I would be engaging the attorneys, but um, uh, to actually intervene. So, and that doesn't mean that we would be taking action, but we would be listening to the arguments and we would be there to represent the districts in their best interest and uh, no, keep the Board of Education. Involved. Thank you. I, just in the interest of time, just mm -hmm. to kind of cut short some of the lengthy, lengthier responses, what I'm reading in here is that, the, that this is directing us to use a specific attorney and, and I'm not comfortable doing that without without discussing if this is something the board would want to do is engage this particular law firm to act on our behalf. Um, if we're also asking the law firm to ask, act on our behalf and act, asking you to act on our behalf and even making the decision for whether or not to participate. Um, I, I'm just, that Maybe it's just something I'm not comfortable with, but I, I really want to caution against using language that's, oh, it's just a blanket thing. It's not just in anything. This is an actual thing. Well, when I say when I say blanket, what I mean is no, that it's Whit, okay. It's, it's okay. Presented this for Thank all you. Other districts. Thank you. I appreciate it. But but I'm speaking to my fellow board members on this. Um, I'm just giving you more information, so it's not just what Dr. We're Petsky. Doing. Thank you, but I don't need more information. I'll ask you. Maybe just a little bit. Dr. Sparlin, can you? Can you please note this conversation? Yep. That's not. Okay. So what I hear, so I, <coughs> just so I just so I understand, what I hear is, correct me if I'm wrong, the part that um, you're you're uncomfortable with is that we are specifically stating the law firm. Is that correct? What I'm uncomfortable with is, yeah. Okay. I, I don't disagree. Is there a way to, um, would we typically not, um, is this typically done without naming a specific law firm so that we have time to have this discussion? I don't know that that we've come across a situation where this was typically necessary at all, uh, regardless of, of the time we've, we've had the one instance that I'm aware of uh, with the Home Depot. But generally speaking, this isn't something that would be so urgent that within 60 days we wouldn't already have a board meeting to discuss it that we would need to necessarily have the ability for, for that. I, gu I guess maybe I should ask the question a different way. Is this time sensitive? Like I know this is like information right now. So does this does this need to be voted on at the next board meeting or no? It's an information item today, right. so that at the next board meeting we can take action on it. So, and and I guess that's my question. Like, do we have to take action by the next board meeting on this? No, like, um, but if, if something were to happen, and here's the. I, I agree, 60 days. Uh, the reason we're bringing this to the board is because before the property tax uh, appeal board could delay, but now they cannot. So the problem is maybe somebody makes a notice to the property tax appeal board and they file it and then it goes 30 days before even coming to my attention. Well, they have, they have 60 days from the time it came to their attention, not my attention. And uh, um, so in order to not have to call a special board of education meeting to allow me the authority to intervene, then uh, uh, that's what this is allowing us to do. If not, then, from the, then it could go to trial. And while I'm waiting to have a board meeting to tell you what the, what the property tax contestant is, I don't have any information because I'm not authorized to go to trial to, to gather any more information. And yet before the next board meeting, I have to go, I, you know, it, it could go through trial without us. So, so do, we, do we have one or two board meetings in December? Just one? Just one. Just one. So we either have to hash this out now yeah. or we have to have a special board meeting in December, right? Those are our two options. Yep. So we can't just. Well, I mean. It, you got a third? If you got a third, I'm listening. 
Well, I, Another this is this is in the event that something were to happen. Well, nothing, I mean, nothing is happening. So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily well, mean we'd have to have it's a question. Well, if you look, at, it says by the last Tuesday in December. So he's saying we could technically be. I mean, there's. It's minimal, but. There's a chance. Where, we were. where it sure. come into play. Yeah. OK, so I guess there's a third option, which is you're willing to roll the dice and take the chance. We're asking Dr. Sparlin, what does he recommend? I like that idea. Dr. Petsky, uh, Mrs. Doyle asked a question in regards to Whitwa LLC. What's the reason why it is Whitwa in here? Well, I, mean, I just want to understand it because they're the one who uh, they're they're the ones that we use for our our property and our financial counsel right now. So uh, I I would I would direct through Whitwa if our if our uh, if our counsel or our financial and property attorneys change, then we could we could use change the resolution to use them. So I guess, I mean, I guess what we can do is I can ask what law, can we take your name out of this and direct a property attorney to request to intervene and that would blanket, that would blanket any property attorney, but they're the one who wrote this resolution. I was gonna say, was it Whit Law that wrote it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah, surely. Well, they're the ones that brought it to my attention. I was even unaware that there was a 60 day intervention timeline being changed at that point. And this, the reason it's coming up now, this is when people can test their property taxes for the next assessment, which will take place in January, February, March. So this is, this is going into action for the next school year, and this is when people are gonna start bringing, uh, contesting property taxes, so it, it could happen January, February, March. Does taking their name off of here exclude them from, uh, f exclude us from using them? No, it does not. So I was going to say, and, and I, have, I have absolutely no concerns with Whitlaw doing this work. Um, but what you could do is um, author in the first sentence there of section two, uh, delegate to the assistant superintendent, the authority, et cetera, et cetera, put a period after Illinois Property Tax Appeal Board, period. And then below, you'll see the last sentence is, further the board delegates to its assistant superintendent the authority to take such actions as are necessary, uh, including but not limited to, you could add there, directing a, a law firm or counsel to file requests to intervene in such appeals, blah, 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 you know, move that down there, adding the rest before hiring an appraiser, et cetera, is without there, naming the law yeah, firm. Yeah, so I don't have a problem with that, but my question, Fundamentally, they are the ones that have done all of our stuff. Do we? Is there a reason why we wouldn't want to just go with the same people who have been doing it? We have the real. If there's a reason why we couldn't, then I'm. I, I want to know so that we We've can. We've been using Whitlaw since about 2000, I believe. In various capacities for various purposes. Yeah. So what this does is directly ties this resolution to one specific law firm. And what if we decide next year to go with a different one? You know, then we're starting all over again. When that's not necessary, you just take the name out. So yeah. So so for this particular reason, but next year it will be a different resolution. Or are you saying this this is for perpetuity, or just if we were to switch law firms, it would be a new resolution. So I think oh, what Marie's saying yeah. this, right. this if we could, did a resolution, there's no reason to have them in Then there. that would could go into perpetuity. Right. I got you. You wouldn't have to come back with a new resolution, it. and it could still be with law for now. I like it. I like that. I would also feel more comfortable with superintendent or designee. I just for what it's worth. Okay. So Maureen's given us the the template and we can get we can Ma Maureen, well, you'll work this up so we can uh, mm -hmm. look this over and then bring this back for approval in December? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Does the board feel comfortable with that? Yeah. Yep. Great. Very good. Thank you. All right. Item 9.5 is an annual information regarding the 2022 tax levy. Yeah, good. Um, let's see. Now it's behind me here. Or where's the presentation to go? Garrett. Full screen that one, or no? Mm -hmm. 
you can go to print and go to print preview and then do it. If you get on to print, don't print, but go to print and it'll give you a preview. It is that time uh, to just kind of present to the board and the community about our, uh, uh, this is just information again for our 2022 tax levy. A couple terms that uh, you'll hear me talk about when we talk about the levy is our equalized assessed value, which uh, is equal to one third of the market value of all the properties in our district. Uh, or for a homeowner, the difference is if you have a $300,000 home, that's what you could sell it for, fair market value. The equalized assessed value is one third of that, or $100,000. Uh, CPI is the consumer price index, and that uh, measures the price of consumer goods and how they're trending. Uh, typically, CPI has been anywhere from like 0.8% to 2.1% uh, for a long time. Uh, this year, uh, CPI is up at 5%, or actually CPI is at 7%, but uh, uh, as you'll see, we're limited to, uh, because of PTEL, our next term, we're limited to uh, uh, our levy of being within uh, either CPI or 5%, whichever is less. The levy is how much we, as a school district, are going to ask for um, so I think the important thing there is the, the levy is what we ask the counties for, um, and the extension is what we actually get. Um, so it's an estimate. How much of our budget, how much of an estimate? Well, here you can see uh, the pie chart that I've shown you in the past on where we get our revenues. We get them from federal, state, and local funds. So local funds is about 60.8% of our budget, and the levy is directly related to the property taxes, which come from the local revenues. So the reason I say the 2022 levy is an estimate is because uh, there are some things that we don't know and we will not know until March or April of next year. However, we need to file the levy December, the last Tuesday in December this year. So we need to file or ask for what we want levied from the counties without knowing all the information. So in this case, you can see the unknowns are, uh, we don't know currently what the true equalized assessed values are. We don't know what the total uh, cost of new property and new construction is for the district. And because we don't know those two elements, we don't know what the limiting tax rate is for the school district. So we're going to be asking you to adopt an ask for, um, for levy without knowing all of the information. What we do know is, and part of the formula is our last year's extension. Last year we received $110 million from uh, property taxes. And last year, these, uh, this year, the CPI for a December of 2021 was 5%. And again, we're limited, uh, actually the CPI was higher, but we're limited to either 5% or CPI. So 5% is the number that we're looking at this year, a number that we've not seen in probably 28 years, since 1994. Is that 5% is that on new construction also? Uh, yeah, the 5% will be on new construction as well. 
So I do have a slide in here that shows what, our, what the CPI has been since 2012. And you can see in 2012 it was 3%. It's been anywhere from 0.8 to now, uh, you know, to 2.3 over the last 10 years. And this year now it'll be 5%. You can see what the total wealth of the district is. So the EAV, Equalized Assessed Value, is $2.4 billion. And I just show you, uh, you know, what Kendall County's EAV is for us and our district, what Will County's estimated EAV is, and what Kane County's estimated EAV. The reason those numbers are orange up here is because we won't know those until February or March or April. So I like this slide. This is what if, what if our assumptions are exactly right? So on here, what I do know is that the CPI is 5%. I do know the actual EAV last year, the other blue number of $2.4 billion. And I'm guessing that the EAV is going to go up about 2.19%. So uh, it'll go from 2.422 to $2.495 billion. In addition, I'm estimating new property of about $20 million. That we don't know, and we won't know, but that's my estimate right now. And uh, I do know that we have 10 outstanding bonds, and I do know that we received $110,000 last year. So if all of my assumptions are right, I get a limiting rate of 4.7%, or our tax rate of 4.7%. And what that means is I can take what we got last year. If you take a look here, we got $110,000 from the counties. And uh, if you look up in all of our nine funds, that's the dollar amount that we levied in each of those funds. So I take my limiting tax rate and I can increase those um, <coughs> to come up with a new levy. So if I'm exactly right, we should get about $117 million from our levy this year up from 110. But that's the question, isn't it? Are, are, am I, are my estimates and my guesses exactly right? So what if they're not quite right? So that's what this slide is telling us. So as you see here, I've got my, what I think the levy should be, but if I'm wrong, what we do in these green columns is I balloon the levy. I ask for more in case my assumptions are not right. So I've increased that levy and uh, uh, so I'm actually going to ask for $121 million, but in the end, I may just only get $117 million. Matter of fact, that's what I'm expecting to get closer to that. So we're not actually saying I need $121 million, but if there's extra property or new property, this actually would cover me right now. My guess was we had $20 million in new property. The, the balloon levy will, would allow that to go up to, I could be wrong, by about $80 million. So there could be, I went up to $100 million in new property. If there is $100 million in new property, we would get $121 million. But the thing with the levy is if you don't ask for it, you don't get it. So if I do ask for 117, and surprise, surprise, there's not $20 million in new property, but there's actually $100 million in new property, I wouldn't get that extra, extra money because I never asked for it. I only get what I ask for based on a bunch of estimates and guesses. So um, the one other thing, because CPI was 5% this year, there's also a law that says if our levy is more than 5% of the previous year's extension. Last year we were, had 110 million. Well, 121 million is actually 9.58% more. 5% of that is because of the CPI. So I am asking for 5% more because that's what CPI was, but I'm also ballooning it a little bit to make sure I'm covering all of my revenue or potential estimates. So we've ballooned it up to 9.58. Um, again, will I get that much? Probably not, unless, uh, unless um, my estimates come back wrong. So we do have to, when I adopt this next, uh, this is also in April, or I'm sorry, in the December 5th board meeting, we'll take action to approve our estimated levy. We will have a truth and taxation hearing like we do with the budget. We'll let the community know we're asking for more than 5%.
see if there's, uh, 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 we'll also, uh, part of the new legislation also is that we disclose what our fund balances are. Um, so that way if we had like 200% of a fund balance, we would have, uh, we, 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 we wouldn't have to levy or ask for that much because we would have the, uh, the funds to fund the school year. So uh, we'll share our fund balance, let the community know that we're asking for more than 5%, vote on the levy to the tune of 9.58% uh, more, and in the end, we'll probably only get the 117 million, which is only 4.7% more than what we got last year. So again, that's what this is showing. These funds, I'm going to ask for 121, but I'm probably only gonna get 117. Uh, what I did is I took the, took the liberty of updating a tax bill. So this slide I like because it says, if, our, if the county's EAV goes up, um, and you saw like sometimes the EAV goes up six, seven, eight percent, the value of the property in the district, and sometimes it only, it, sometimes it goes down three percent. If the EAV goes down, the tax rate goes up, so we can still get what we got last year, the 110 million plus a little bit more for the new taxes. But if property values go up, then the tax rates come down and people's homes are worth more and they're just paying more taxes on the higher assessed value um, or they're paying the tax rate on the higher assessed value. So this just kind of shows as the EAV goes up, the tax rate comes down. If the EAV in our counties goes down, then the tax rates go up. So, so here's my updated tax bill, um, which uh, as you see here, this is a, a home in the district that is worth, uh, its fair market value is $303,000. So its EAV is worth, uh, is worth one third of that or $101,000. And then you can see here the different taxing bodies uh, for this homeowner. So we've got the school district at about 6.35% um, goes to the school district or $6,431. And you can see like the example like the Forest Preserve, their taxing rate is 0.162, or for this homeowner, $163 will go to the uh, uh, Forest Preserve. So at the very end, the whole tax rate for this homeowner is 9.35%, and their total bill will be $9,400, of which the school district is about $6,000. So you can see why a lot of people are very, uh, very, um, they like to stay up on Interested, the interested. <laughs> what did you say? Interested, <laughs> there you go. I said, are very I said it, I said irritated. I thought I heard interested. You can, you can look interested. for whatever word you want, but it's irritated, <laughs> I assure you. The one point, and I, I know several board members have heard this, so I'm kind of really talking to the community for those who are listening. But as you look at the school district's tax rate in the finance facility committee last year, they really wanted us to point this out. On the tax bill, it says that our school district's tax rate is 6.3%. But, you know, other surrounding districts are between, you know, maybe four and a half and five and a half percent. But uh, the, the issue there is we have outstanding bonds. So yeah. our tax rate is actually comparable to our neighbors when you look at our operating tax rate is actually 4.76%. But because we have bonds and interest we need to pay to the tune, right now I believe we've got about $235 million in outstanding referendum dollars. We need to collect 1.59% in a levy to pay our debt. So that, that's that 1.59, it's about a $36 million payment per year that we're paying. So our tax rate of 6.35 is actually 4.76, which is a decent amount for the surrounding areas. Then you have to add the 1.59% in addition because of our, our borrowing. And, and can I just reiterate something? Yes. Sorry, just so people are aware when, when I like that you broke this down because yeah. the 4.76 is operating. So when people say, where, where, where is my tax money going, or why isn't it going, or what's it doing for the schools? The 1.59 out of that, yeah. 
is paying off the mortgages yep. basically yeah. for for buildings that now need maintenance on top of everything else. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm just sorry. So and another way to look at that is this homeowner for the school district, rather than 6,431, if we didn't have the outstanding debt, they would only be paying $4,760 to uh, the school district for, so it would, their tax bill would be a little less. And when potentially could that happen? And uh, 2034, 2034. We'll have our bonds paid off. Yeah. <laughs> right. Allie, let me get me started. Allie, are you irritated? I am way irritated. <laughs> I'm they never will gonna be vote paid for off. Tax increase. I'm never going to vote for it ever. <laughs> well, you, well, come with okay. your cuts, though. Now let's, let's, come let's, with your list of cuts. You recall? Do you recall yeah, the other? Is, is increasing fees. Uh, or come right. with a list of cuts. Well, we just, I mean, come, we, we come just come sat along. here the other week talking about how we wanted to look at decreasing fees, and then we also talked about how we, um, what it would do if we did not, if if the levy held steady, or if the if we didn't levy, we saw yeah. all those dollars, and we the, saw. The, what they do, what the consequences of that are. And I'm glad well, you brought that up because the last two slides here are going to be my base five-year scenarios. And since we're talking about the levy rather than all four projections, I'm just going to show you what my base assumptions are for the next five years. But then if we had no new levy dollars, what would that do? And, and that will give some context for that projection. But, Jared, it looked like you had another question. Well, I'm just going to say, you know, I mean, just – Again, you know, the, we have a duty to do here, and what we don't want to do, you, you and I live through this, right? And so if we're going to come here and say, hey, we're not going to vote for a tax increase, don't do that to another board. Like, don't dump on them, a you know, we're, we're sitting here having to do a bunch of cuts from a previous board. By the same board. token, you don't get to tell me how to vote. It's about don't. I'm not telling you how to board. I'm not telling you how to vote. I am telling you to dump on somebody else. Well, I mean, if the truth hurts, but truth but what I, hurts. what I'm saying, you vote how you want to vote. But what I'm saying is, we have we have a duty to make this actually make sense. So if you're going to do that, I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm telling you then then I look forward to seeing your list of cuts, which is called reality. But so I'm looking forward to your reality. That's that's all. I mean, because if all you're going to do is just say, "Well, I'm I'm going to vote no," then you're relying on all the rest of us to govern. That's what you're doing. You can hate that, but that's the reality. Unless you're coming with a list of cuts so that we can have the discussion about whether we well then then that's a real discussion about hey let's okay we're gonna then we're gonna cut whatever it is eight nine million dollars that's fine then that's a real discussion. But if all you're doing is saying, I'm going to vote no so everybody else can govern, that's not, a re that's not reality. Okay. Next. <laughs> all right. So the last two slides here, um, just when you read these, um, this is the uh, base assumptions, which assumes that we levy, uh, actually, we levy 2% additional every year. And if you look at here, the revenue columns at the top, again, the levy falls under the local revenue. So if you see last year, we got all 118 million, which 106 million was the levy property tax. This year in 2022, um, or I'm sorry, in 2022, we got 110 million. So $8 million came from other local sources. This year, we're projected to get 117 million. And then the year after that, 129. And if we, uh, if we continue to see that 2%, notice how the local revenues go up about 2.92%, 2.95%. That's because the levy's going up 2% every year. So the local revenues are uh, projected to be the full, full levy, what we can do. And you'll notice then on our surplus deficit, the blue line, every year what our surplus is because of the dollars that we had budgeted both you know, local, state, and federal. So now let's look at uh, when the board says, what if we add no additional new levy? And that's what this second assumption is. The, the FY22, what we're levying right now is not for next year, but for 2025. So in 2025, do you notice the local revenues go down to 0.45%, then they go down to 0.52, and then 0.61? That's because we're holding the levy flat. We're not adding any, uh, we're not getting 2% additional on top of that, or CPI. So what that does in 2025 
is it actually takes our fund balance where before in 2025 we had a 3.1 million dollar surplus now we're at a 1.6 million dollar deficit because we don't have the extra 1.6 million dollars from the levy um, and then the next year if we continue to hold the levy flat we have an additional 2.73 million that we would have to cut from the budget and then in 2027, if we held the, the levy flat for a third year, we would have an additional $5.2 million we would have to cut from the budget that year. Two, two things I'd like the board to know about this is, number one, is that when you hold the levy flat, and I didn't really talk about this a lot, but the, the, what you're allowed to get the extension next year is based on the extension the previous year. So if you hold the levy flat, then you that's cumulative. So for instance, if we were only to hold the levy flat for one year and lose that $1.6 million, we would have to make budget cuts so we don't have a deficit budget. But the truth of the matter is that every year after that, if we went back to levying normal, we would always be $1.6 million short every year it accumulates we would never be able to make up that amount because we left it on the table and said we don't want to levy it. And since we didn't levy it, it was not extended to us, it was not given to us, and we can never realize that again. And if we held the levy, if we held the levy and no levy, it wouldn't be 1.6 million short, it would be 4.7 million short because we wouldn't have the 3.1 million surplus. surplus. Correct. And then this, that's only for one year, and I know Dr. Sparrow and I were talking about this earlier, that's cumulative, and, and Jared too in a previous conversation, that's cumulative, so we'd have to cut 1.6 million this year, 2.7 million, and 5.2, so over three years of holding the levy flat, we would lose $9.58 million in three years. And that's cumulative because now we can never recapture that, that extension amount because we never claimed it to begin with. Correct. So I, I hope that I feel like we made a little bit more uh, leeway this year uh, from last year. I, that's a lot of information about school budgeting, but the uh, importance of the levy and the dynamics of the levy. So uh, this is just for information today. I'd be happy to take any questions you have, but this would be coming to the board for action on December 5th. With, we would also have a public hearing about the truth in taxation, which uh, this district has not done that since 2010. So You just gave us a master class. <laughs> you go. know, when we go to the uh, AAA conference, they're going to have a class just like this one. Yep. yep. Do, you, do you have time by December 5th if, if a board member, if one of us reaches out to you and says, hey, I don't want to go the route of the levy, I want to go the route of cuts, do you have time to have a conversation with them about what cuts you could um, possibly explore or fees. Uh, you mentioned raising fees, Ms. Doyle, or raising fees. Um, I think that uh, I think that I'd want to involve my uh, my boss in on that one too. So I think Dr. Sparlin and probably the cabinet would all. I mean, those are the types of decisions that impact the district. Oh, so I don't disagree, but from a financial perspective, I'd be happy to sit down and listen to a list. But as far as decision makers on that, that would be presented to the cabinet to find out what is in the best interest of the district and how does that I'll refer I'll rephrase. Do you have, if one of us reaches out to you, do you have the ability to give options? What do you mean options? No, not without any conversations, no. Yeah. So you, you don't have the ability to come up with a list? Oh, we have the ability to. We have not had that discussion. Oh, right, that's what I'm asking. So if, some, if one of us says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not, if I, if I, Turn around to you tomorrow and say, I'm a no. Um, I'd rather look at the list. You can you can give me a list. We can always before December 5th. Before we December. Can, we can always come up with a list if we okay. correct. Thanks. I just wanted that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. So this question really is, am I gonna reach out to you and ask about cuts? Dr. Petsky, in these projections, sure do you right include do increases in state funding? I do as well. So if you look at the state funding, you'll see it's going up four uh, percent per year. Uh, this year, it ended up going up about nine uh, percent because of our uh, the tier districts moving from tier one to tier two. Uh, but I'm keeping that at a I'm keeping that at a four percent increase. Okay. 
at the state funding level. And that one, there is a projection where we hold that level. That's with the no new EBF uh, projection, but I didn't present that one today. But this one, the base scenario and the no new levy is evidence-based funding being held at a 4% increase every year. Are there any other questions for Dr. Petsky on this item? So I just want to clarify. So this factors in the 4% increase in EBF, is that correct? Uh, both of them do. And Thank you. This, this second one is the base assumption, but it's no new levy. So it's only the 2% right. I less in I just want to correct. Thank you. Okay, hearing no other questions. We'll move on to item 9.6. Is an informational item regarding where we are with looking at a new student information system. Dr. Kincaid. I'm sorry, Dr. Kincaid. <laughs> I'm sorry about this whole situation. <laughs> um, right, this is why we should just get mess. the cheapest thing there is. <laughs> um, so we do not have a choice um, <laughs> of moving forward with a new student information. So as we listen and discuss um, our options and moving forward, just please keep that in the back of the mind. Um, I would not ever <laughs> want to bring this presentation to any of you at this point of the year, but we have no options. Um, so as you know, we learned on July 20th that Tyler Sis would not be supported moving forward for the 23-24 school year for our particular district. Now, Tyler Sis is one piece of a very large puzzle of utilization that we currently use for Tyler Technologies. The decision of the company not to support Tyler Sis does not influence the other products that we currently utilize. Oh. So that will continue. So we're really just focused on a new SIS at this point. Um, so hmm. with that then, Tyler also announced a partnership with Infinite Campus um, moving forward. So what happened is we took the um, information that we received at the end of July um, and attended a variety of meetings in August um, through the process to learn more about what that partnership would be um, and then also um, to hear how that would influence us specifically. Once we attended those meetings, um, we decided we needed to really cast a wider net. Um, so we met with our district SIS, we met with technology, we met with our administration to discuss what would be those steps forward. From there, um, what we started to do in September was then talk with our um, OEA and OESPA, um, really focusing on our stakeholders that were most impacted by this decision of a new SIS. Um, at that point, we looked at what those stakeholders groups would be and we pushed out a survey to our entire district. Um, we did push out all of these individual surveys and shared the links, um, not only through a individual email, but also through our communications department in our Friday update to our staff. So we gave any staff member the opportunity to provide feedback of what was important to them in an SIS um, related to these topics. Um, you can see we were uh, very fortunate to receive 561 responses from our staff. Um, very uh, proportionately to the membership corresponding to that group. Um, some From that information, we formulated like uh, what our high priorities were in looking at new vendors. Um, anything from communication, um, our teachers, our building admin, special ed, everybody um, expressed the interest to be able to individualize, email families through SIS, email the class, email multiple classes. That was something that was very important, um, as was having parent and student access. Um, we really encourage, especially at the secondary level, our students to check their grades and missing assignments. Um, so we wanted that interactivity that we currently have um, with our students and families. Um, also essential with our teachers is compatibility with Google Classroom. That essentially is serving as our LMS right now. Our teachers are posting assignments, um, completing assessments. So right now we have compatibility um, 
in terms of transfer of class rosters, um, graded assignments in Google Classroom. So our people, teachers don't have to um, like double enter grades both in Google Classroom and in the essay. Um, online registration. Two years ago, we went to an online registration model to make it easier for our parents and families to submit information um, year to year. So we had quite a few um, elements from our different stakeholders that we were really looking forward um, for as we looked at our vendors. From there, we also put out the request for people to participate. So we wanted to make sure that we had representation at different levels. We have an early childhood rep, we have an elementary, junior high, high school. We wanted to make sure that we had not only at the levels, but also at the roles and responsibilities. So we have teachers, we have counselors, we have secretaries, registrars, uh, we have district admin, building admin. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had people from all of our specialized focus areas of special ed, EL, health services. Um, and then at the district level, we wanted that representation in addition. When all of that was said and done, we have 52 members on our committee. <coughs> So it is pretty large, um, but we did then have the opportunity to um, hold our review sessions um, through a vendor review process um, remotely. So we um, essentially put out a platform that allowed anyone on our committee to submit questions. We did a, an hour long vendor review where our vendor demoed their product, we provided the feedback to the vendor of what those essential topics were that we were looking for as part of a SIS. Um, after the hour demo, then we asked all of the questions that the committee um, provided. Then we also gave the um, committee the chance to submit questions um, via a survey. And from there, we reached back out the event to the vendor to get additional information. So um, we then were able to follow up with the committee with additional videos or resources. Um, one uh, of our vendors was able to provide a sample login so they could go in and maneuver around the product. These are the four vendors that we did have come in um, and meet with our committee members. Um, at this point, um, we are in the last phase of feedback from our committee. So when each of the vendors presented, um, we did have the opportunity to talk about kind of what a core product would be and then what are those essential items that we need because we want to look at a similar product across. We don't want you know, uh, to look at uh, systems that are not comparable because as you can see, all four products have different modules and different opportunities. Um, so what we decided kind of based on the committee feedback was that we had to have reporting both at the teacher, school, and district level with all of our reports that our teachers want to push out that our secretaries and admin want to be able to look at what we have to do in terms of state and federal compliance. So reporting was one key issue. Um, learning integration with Google Classroom, um, the online registration, the messenger with email, scheduling, and then professional learning in terms of we wanted to be able to have resources ongoing available to our staff members. So with that, um, that's at that point where we are. Um, we are, as I mentioned, very, very close to making the final recommendation of a vendor. Um, all four vendors, we would have kind of a transition period from the point where we sign the contract through 6.30. We have to run some overlap um, in terms of Tyler, SIS, where we currently are, and a new vendor, because we have to not only migrate all of the data, but we also have to start training our staff. Um, we cannot wait until we come back in August, and we cannot wait till July 1st to migrate our data. Um, so. We would be coming on 12-5 with that final recommendation. We would um, like to sign that contract as soon as possible to start the migration of data. That's what we would start first, um, and then we would start the training of staff in the spring. Um, 
so the next kind of wave after the final selection is in terms of meetings we have our specialized as i asked special ed health once we have our final final vendor and then all of our planning from here future integrations that we've talked and seen as part of our four possibilities revolve around food service online payments kind of that voice communication that we currently have special ed and human resources we are not focused on bringing those third party systems in at this time but it's part of that conversation and planning of what we could bring into an sis recommendation but right now given our timeline this is just thoughts to the future of how we could streamline resources and supports but these are identified areas of potential wrap-in products with current third party vendors question so are you ready for are we ready for questions i would be more than happy to answer any questions well i'm just real salty right now about the whole thing so because i was here the first time when we went from what did we have before we had tyler and i did that was just a whole process so to have to go through that again i'm sorry but my question is is tyler giving us a refund a rebate on all the trouble that we have to go through are we getting any discounts on the products that were that are staying with them i i just um so we will have access to their sis through the end of our current contract um in terms of moving forward and some of your other questions that would um go to dr pesky because that will no longer be an sis product that we would be using with tyler technologies so that would really focus on so i do not have that i do not have that i only have one quick question and that is so it says recommendation for action on 12 5 22 you're i'm assuming that means information on 12 5 and then we're going to vote on our first meeting back in january is that correct or are we doing both on information and vote on 12 5 so right now the or we're not even voting on it you're just telling us no no i ideally um it would be well no 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 i was gonna say i'm pretty sure we have to vote on it but yeah sure it will be because the cost for any of this new system will be a new cost right um so the while we have an sis budgeted in our current um probably be additional it's an additional cost in order from whenever we sign in through until 6 30. so it would really be for not only the product but the approval of the additional funds in order to migrate the data and train our staff so so is this information and vote on 12 5. yes so information is well it's now. further information yeah. so the information, information is, is now, now. Well, we well, well, like well, well well we don't know which one we're going with right right so so email it is you're going to be telling us which one you're going to go with yep. and we're going to vote on it at the same time yes mm -hmm. right and because we don't know why like we don't know right. why we went with you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it will be one of these I'm not, four. I'm not, I'm not upset an, about that. I just want to know. An exception. How many <laughs> teachers right now can't get in a Tyler? Um, so I followed right. up on your question, and we did not have any um, Tyler downtime that day that we were informed of. Hmm. So I'm not saying we do not have Tyler downtime, just not on that particular day. <laughs> I reached out to our SIS. I'd be very surprised. But part of the reason that it's important yeah. to have this approved on 12-5 is because if we don't, we wouldn't. Ha if we didn't have this approved until mid-January, it takes over. It, it's a, it's eliminating a month of work opportunity that we have to get this work done. Correct. Correct. Okay. We could not start any type of migration until after a contract was signed. I just wanted to clarify and wanted the heads up. That's all. Yeah. Got it. No surprises. So this is a, it's, it's kind of two and a half questions. So one is a point of clarification for me. I, you're saying it's only the, the, the SIS. So what are the other Tyler systems that we will continue to use? Infinite Visions. Okay. So Infinite Visions is currently used um, for human resources and finance. Uh, okay. And then Tyler Tech does Versatran as well. 
So what was the last one? Versatrans, our transportation system, but they're not connected. Okay. So I noticed that Power Schools is listed on the vendor list. If that is the same company, how are we currently using them? Well, I mean, we can recoup our costs. We didn't attempt to. We are not using Power School for SIS. So, Dr. Petsky, how I. It's on our vendor list. I agree. Power schools. It's a, it's a, I don't provide, know if it's the same. Uh, it's Pearson. Um, Power school, they provide like assessments and things like that. So oh, Pearson. Oh. Is that the, it's not the same? But not Pearson is not. Pearson's different. It says no. power schools. Unless I read it wrong. I, I, I was pretty sure it said. I, I can look into that one. But Power School actually has a lot of, they've got a lot of different systems. So there might be, I don't know. Okay, and so in reviewing the vendor contract report, I, I, I kind of pointed out maybe like five different systems that I didn't know whether or not they, when we adopt this new one, would it be redundancy that we can potentially decommission something that else that we're also using? And that's part that's the of the future discussion. Got it. So right now, we're just looking at SIS because we have to um, make sure everything is in and working, Makes but sense. there are, um, especially with certain of the vendors that we're looking at, they do have some systems that would be able to fold in and replace. Um, so that would be our next steps. But not the initial cost. I was trying to save money initially, but initially it's going to be a new cost no matter what. So. What I've been told from all four vendors is that we have the ability to add and delete modules um, uh, at different points throughout the contract. Um, but right now, to try to replace an SIS and run concurrent systems over the next six months, Makes sense. Um, I would need other departments to do what you're asking. No, no. We will sense. definitely look into that as no, soon I, as I get it. Um, an I SIS get it. is up and working. Um, because right when we obviously roll on December or July 1st, then we also come into not only a new school year, but then also uh, state reporting and ensuring all of our state data that Faith talked about before is accurate. July, August, and September is essential mm -hmm. for those times. Um, we actually had to have some conversations with Tyler because they had initially told us that it would end on 830, which is not in alignment. So um, we requested the extension of that. No, I get you 100%. So, I, I, 100%. Yes. We are trying to go as quickly but as thoroughly as possible I get it. in this process. And um, Mr. Simonson, I definitely, uh, Faith and I started right as that transition was trying to come to fruition. So while we were not part of the initial decision, we were definitely part of the um, rollout that Struggles. we walked into. So um, we're yeah. trying to get ahead of the curve right now. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Oh, and Eugene, just to answer your question, we use uh, Power School.